Hey, could someone power this up? 32 minutes, 21 seconds. Five second tone followed by a one second pause. You are listening to Space Boy Universe. Okay, gang, let's go. Let's go. Strap in and prepare for launch sequence. Greetings and salutations. I am Space Boy. And I am Solana. And this is Space Boy Universe. It is October 22nd, 2016, and we're on show number 105. Tonight's special guest will be Mono Interami, who will talk about the circuit. But he'll be here shortly, and then, of course, later on tonight, we will be talking 80 sci-fi movies. As always, follow us on Twitter. That's at the SB Universe. Follow Serlana at Serlana, and, of course, me at Space Boy Music. And please remember to hashtag your tweets with hashtag SB Universe or hashtag Space Cadets. Hang out with all the Space Cadets by going to SpaceBoyUniverse.com. Click on the dancing chat bubble in the player, and that will get you in with all the cool kids. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. Just search for Space Boy Universe. Speaking of YouTube, you know, you can find more than the Space Boy Universe archive of shows. There is video content from Space Boy Music, video interviews, 2-Bit Gamers, and so much more. If you can't catch the show live, that's not a problem. You can... Take the universe on the go with you with Spreaker, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Because, boy, do we love broadcasting. And on that note, how are you, Serlana? Well, I'm not laughing. Well, Because you I, told me not to laugh, and that um, cheesed me off. Well, I wanted a straightforward introduction, and now that we've got that out of the way, great. Now, of course, uh, thank you for making me aware that 9 o'clock had come. And I wasn't even aware of it, and uh, so that's why we had this kind of bizarre startup on the on the show. But I am glad to be broadcasting tonight. What about you? Well, I yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, we uh, got a chance to. Uh, I guess uh, Mono Interim is going to be with us at the bottom of the hour. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of time, uh, yeah, but he's so, at an event. Yeah, he's so. at an event. So, but he'll come in briefly talk about the circuit and how his project is going along. Um, but uh, we have content as far as um, going beyond that where mm-hmm. we'll be talking 80s sci-fi movies. And, you know, I guess after he calls, if other people want to call in and talk about the topic, mm-hmm. uh, we that's encur- great. We encourage anybody to call in, and that number is 713-701-5214. 713-701-5214. Ooh, I, I, <laughs> I better turn my phone off. Yeah, you're going to get. <laughs> I'm getting slammed right now. Um, there it goes. So, um, what? Uh, I just flipped that thing. So I have every notification that makes a sound turned off. Even when my sound is on, I just turned everything off. Well, except for the text message you get. I guess I'll give you a gold star because I, I'm. I guess I'm. I guess I shouldn't have taken that nap earlier. Well, uh, <laughs> speaking of the text message sound, my text message sound on my phone for when anyone texts me through you know mm-hmm. the carrier um is the star trek voyager door chime well i have beethoven's um i guess is it fifth no, that's I, awful I, long for it well it's just da 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 yeah and usually it's it's you tweeting me or not tweeting me texting me so 
uh, I, it gets my attention. And, of course, everybody kind of looks at me like, you know, uh, who's that? You know, mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. how, what what has been going on this week? Uh, well, what should um, we d- we discuss with the with the space cadets out there and all that good stuff? Well, I'm freaked out. It's 66 degrees with only 50 percent humidity, and I don't know how to feel about it. <laughs> yeah, Friday it hit us pretty good because uh, when it, you know I was leaving work, it was nice and windy. I actually had to go do uh, a, a run for a vendor and um our client and so that drive in the afternoon was really pleasant i pulled the windows down and and uh it was nice cruising weather yeah I, you know and i left work at four it was I, I, i'm in a garage on the bottom floor and i was like this feels different is this what people keep talking about this fall thing this mm-hmm. concept which will probably last for three days and it'll be right back to summer right because that's texas it is so, um, uh, have you read anything? What what projects are you on, or you, you wanted, or you wish to discuss, or can you discuss anything about your projects that you're working on? Oh, those projects. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm doing two projects to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing some contract work on the side, which makes me sound like I'm working for the mafia. <laughs> I just realized how that sounded, but no. Um, I'm doing some video editing work, very tiny thing. It's like the kind of stuff I would do for you, but with, for someone else that has money. Uh, and oh, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you for... That you someone know. actually pays me money. <clears throat> and then I may end up doing a one-page <clears throat> web page for this person for the same project. And I might end up doing a larger project for this person. And, you know, if I get saddled with that, I will make them pay. But um, So you're kind of doing a music video, right? A music video trailer, yeah. And then, while I'm doing that, <coughs> I'm working on it, if you want me to say. Um, how can we put this? Not the thing we did today, but <coughs> the, the one I've been working on. Uh, is this Space Boy related? Or? Yeah, it's just our website, the one oh, we uh, currently yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, yeah. Uh, I'm working on a new version of the Space Boy website. We're going to have to move, move it, rehome it. Um, make it uh, yeah. SOC uh, more SEO friendly SEO, and um, yeah. I'm doing it to where I can get in there and get into the guts of it because the way we have it now it's just sort of a point and click thing mm-hmm. whereas My- this I bought a template and I've sort of gutted the template out to cons- to what we need and it's looking really good. Um, my only concern is that um, since you know since the dawn of time before um, you know you st- used to do my website for music and then i kind of like pulled it away from you because uh there was a lot of head pounding on you know you know uh, just because well html has come <coughs> a long way css has come a long way dreamweaver cc now is just amazing that's come a long long way it's very uh it's so much nicer to use now so and I think once we get everything like you want it, I'm not going to say like I want it because it was like I want it had been done. Um, it'll just be a few things get updated every now and then. So. Well, like I was saying, uh, you have a tendency to have Tourette's when it comes to web design. Well, you would too if you actually did it uh, well, I, on the level I've got to get I in there with. You're pretty extreme when uh, something doesn't go quite right. and, and um, but uh, I actually downloaded... Microsoft Expression Web, which I didn't even know existed. Apparently, this is what quietly took the place of front page. Yeah. And I was pleasantly surprised. It's no Dreamweaver, but it did have a, um, when you're looking at the code view and you're looking at your, your page, and if there's a class or an ID, that's a CSS thing, you can actually, it's hyperlinked. In the code, you could click it, and it'll open the CSS document and point right to that class or ID. I'm like, oh, wow. That's not, not even Dreamweaver does that. So. But the, the way the direction is going, it's looking really good. And yeah, Flash is going to die, Dennis. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, Flash. it's got maybe six months. Uh, you know, funny that you brought that up because, uh, you know, I was looking at the Adobe website, and what's replacing Flash, because you, you could use Flash to animate things. 
and you still can, but the direction now is they've changed it. It's called animated mm-hmm. or animate something like that. Yeah, something like that. And um, but it's it, it's just it looks like the layout, the timeline that we see in Premiere and stuff. But we um, opened opened some file, some image file today. Something I thought I made, and it says this file has something something information from Adobe uh, Fireworks. And I'm like. Bleep, 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 <laughs> fireworks. I mean, <laughs> just, I didn't even have that. <laughs> I love what you said. You said, who cares about fireworks? And I very quietly I said, who's said, using fireworks? I, I, I basically kind of quietly said to her, I said, um, Perry, uh, Katy Perry. <laughs> and you just gave me this dirty look like, you know, okay, that wasn't funny. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the website is going good. And, um, you know. Yeah, the whole uh, one page of it. There's some... <sighs> Big announcements that are going to be coming soon, um, because there is a gonna there is another. I was going to sound like Mario there for a second. Yeah, there's another website. It's going to be a minute. It's going to be in a website. Uh, it's all the good. Uh, and um, <laughs> I think you should stop now before you get in trouble. So, but yeah, um, there is another website you're working on, and it, it's Space Boy related. You relate it to the universe and. This uh, our Spreaker channel. And sorry, no, I can't get that out of my head. <laughs> Mario, the web developer. <laughs> oh no, I forgot to put the web tag in. <laughs> but um, yeah, so but yeah, go. <laughs> this is just terrible. But um, so yeah, so big announcements coming, and I, I wish I could talk about it now. But as we get closer, uh, you know, you'll find out that there is a. Uh, more Space Boy related things out there and mm-hmm. we're building it and don't be surprised if you come across some of these things and we'll explain them as they come but uh, until then you know just know that we're always building on the universe and it looks the universe pretty cool. is expanding yeah, always so let's see what else um, you know I've been boning up on my I guess DC Universe TV watching. I started watching The Flash finally, and uh, I'm caught up on that, and uh, that's been fun. Um, I, I I'm watching the DC Legends uh, TV show, and it was great the first season, but now there's been you know quite a few people that they've just dropped off, and it had the one guy that um, was in Doctor Who with Matt and um, Karen, and um, and I'm forgetting their last names, so please forgive me. But um, yeah, they, he ha- he was in two episodes or one episode, I think, and now he's he's disappeared from the show. So it's kind of disappointing, but I'm um, still kind of watching it because it's interesting and um, and so you know how I love uh, superhero movies and TV shows. But uh, but that's what I've been up to uh, as far as TV watching. Um, also, the twist for American Horror Story Roanoke. Uh, was kind of cool. I kind of figured that that was the direction they were going to go. They basically were doing this documentary style thing and showing the events that happened. But when you get to, I guess, season, it's if it's episode six of season six, and it's another six in there. So it's kind of like six, six, six. Uh, and so, um, but what they've done is turned it around where the documentary people, uh, the do- it's a documentary. And now this documentary, uh, the the people that were producing it have gone back to the house with the actors that were portraying the people that they were doing the documentary on with the people of the documentary. And it's just, it's a twist. It makes your mind just want to explode. Um, like Stimmy Tech, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, so you, are you talking about Marvel and stuff? No, I'm, well, I was talking about Marvel. I went off to American Horror Story. Oh. Uh, which is uh, I know let me that, know if you talk Marvel I'll tune back in uh, well um, I think I've pretty much well speaking of Marvel you've got um, Doctor Strange coming up in November and I'm excited about to see that now a lot of people say the probably to see this movie you probably want to go to IMAX possibly even see it in 3d because of all the um, special effects that they have for this movie storyline is eh, it's all right but the special effects are going to be awesome. And I've seen some of the uh, clips from that show, and it looks pretty cool. So, Well, if you were, I was going to mention that, tell me what you were telling me earlier today in the car about Deadpool 2. Um, I had heard, I, I just saw an article where I can't think of the director has backed out because of creative differences 
with uh, Ryan Reynolds, and um, I can understand where Ryan's coming from. He wanted this project so bad to be, you know, to be produced, and he knew that he could do it, and he proved. I'm he amazed he got away with what he did in the first one. And you know, I would can only assume that Ryan Reynolds is trying to keep the Deadpool character true to character. True to character. And so, if somebody comic. else is coming along to say mm, we should tweak this, I'm sure he's saying no. I don't think so. You know, and uh, Ryan, you know, you got to give it up to Ryan because he brought the Deadpool character. I think pretty accurate as far as how he's portrayed in the comic book. Um, I know that you loved the original Deadpool movie, and um, you know you've seen him in different things like games and stuff like that, and you really enjoyed mm -hmm. that content. Yeah. Um, have you seen any trailers for Guardians of the Galaxy 2? I've seen some. Uh, there's a, a new clip out there, and it looks pretty cool. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've seen the clip, uh, but the, it has all the game back together again. It looks like uh, Groot is a mini Groot, and I saw him mm -hmm. like hanging out on Rocket's uh, shoulder. Uh, and so, but yeah, that's got to be a good movie. I mean, Chris Pratt is just really funny, and um, uh, I'm still hoping that they might consider him for Indiana Jones. Uh, I know a lot of people would be like, "Oh no, don't want him to be." One. I think you know, let's give it. A, I mean, he looks like he would be a great. He's got that personality for indiana jones and yeah that, but that look. bless his heart he, he doesn't seem like he has the intelligence to be a professor well i mean that's the wonderful thing about movies you can be anybody and and fake it and so but did you were you not telling me that, or was this a fantasy of yours about them <laughs> Guardians oh, and yeah. um, Avengers finally merging. Well, yeah, because uh, I read somewhere where Chris Pratt is going to be uh, featured in the upcoming Marvel movie, and I can't remember which one. It's uh, where they go after Thanos. And Thanos. Thank you, man. Give it up for you. Gold star. Um, I, I, I know it because it rhymes with Manos. <laughs> so, but yeah, at some point he's going to be involved in – uh, with the, uh, them, and also there's been rumors or talks about having the Defenders um, be in the movies too. And who's the Defenders? I'm glad you asked that question. I've that, never heard of okay, such a thing. Okay, you, you know that I am. I love Netflix, uh, and so Netflix and Marvel have those movie or TV shows uh, where you have my, um, Jessica Jones, you have Daredevil, you have. Uh, uh, other characters that are coming down the pipe. I don't know if the Punisher would be in that uh, or if he would or not. Um, but, uh, yeah, you have all these movies or all these characters that are on Netflix right now. And they're going to come together and they form a group called the Defenders. And so from the – oh, Luke Cage. How could I forget him? He is awesome. He is one bad – shut your mouth. But um, they are all going to come together and eventually they're going to have a movie – together on netflix and we guess they're gonna beat the snot out of each other well i don't think they'll somebody. Be, beat the snot out, they'll beat the snot out of somebody yeah but um i wonder if it might be kingpin related or um someone else you've lost me i have uh, no idea who you're just, talking about just, now just shake your head and say yes that's dear. nice dear Th thank you i appreciate it and um so hopefully they will be on the big screen with the marvel characters so if you're talking about you know if we're still talking about sci-fi and movies tonight current sci-fi uh what do you make of the hold um they finally cast a young lando calrissian that is great news um danny uh is it uh, danny glover right or yeah donald danny, donald, donald glover donald glover somebody so, probably calls him yeah donnie uh, uh, yeah that's just my gene hackman syndrome kicking that's in, in 2018 <clears throat> but uh i think it's going to be great to have him as lando um, it should be a great uh, overall. I mean, to see the young Han Solo and young Lando Calrissian before he, uh, I guess, maybe loses the Falcon to Han, and um, and then later on how he acquires the uh, Cloud City, and so all that's going to be great. I mean, Star Wars. I mean, I can't get enough of it. You know, I don't can't get enough of it. I mean, uh, I'm watching the uh, Star Trek or Star Trek. Please forgive me, Star Wars fans. Star Wars Rebels, which is a, kind of an animated thing. I've heard rumors that there's supposedly a connection between Rebels and the more current Star Wars saga films that are coming out. And then this this coming Christmas area, uh, you're going to have Star 
Wars Rebels. Um, is it no? It's Rogue One. I'm sorry. See, I'm getting all my Star Wars mixed up. And then uh, you know, so you got all that, and then you got the Han Solo thing. You got Lando. Uh, there's uh, Ian McGregor has have been like saying, "Hey, I deserve a Obi Wan Kenobi movie. I would see that. That would be great." Yeah, it, Ian likes playing. Are you and yeah. likes playing Obi Wan? Yeah. Apparently, and he's at that right age to do it. It would be like uh, after the Clone Wars, where he goes to Tatooine and kind of watches. Um, uh, over Luke Skywalker as he grows up, and uh, I have an audio book that I haven't listened to that talks about that time period when he's on Tatooine. But um, it should be really good, as far as you know. I, I would go see that. You know, I, I I just imagine the picture of Fry where he's saying, "Here, take my money." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would go see that. And once again, uh, Disney has really uh, is really doing the Marvel version for Star Wars, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and um, and I think they're being pretty effective. I think they've learned from Marvel how to effectively create a multi universe of characters and and kind of win as far as you know selling it to the people that want to go see it. You know, it's it's kind of like going back to Deadpool. You know, if you make it the way the fans want it, then they'll come and they'll watch it. Um, and you're seeing that right now with Star Wars. I mean, many years, we had only three movies, and then we came out with the prequels. Now, a lot of people hate the prequels um, for various different reasons, but um, I guess Jar Jar being one. But I liked it. I think it, if you kind of look at it from a perspective of, you know, that the way it was filmed, it was like kind of an older time, and it had that glossy look and whatever. But um, it was a good set of movies. Granted, uh, my favorite out of the three was Clone Wars, which ties back into the animated things that we've watched. And um, But, uh, you know, when you had those three movies, you know, you keep going back to the hardcore Star Wars fans. Those three core uh, movies, four, five, and six, we thought we would never get seven, eight, or nine because there's always the rumors or George saying there was these movies, but he never thought, we would never thought that he would have gotten to him. So when he sold it to Disney, uh, it was great to to finally have somebody could take over that. I mean, and Disney has proven that they're capable of taking a property like that and, and making it a, a really good story and good uh, good for the fans, if you will. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, a good um, exposition. Well, thank you. What okay. else you got there? In summary, Star Wars, I'm so over it. Um, why don't you comfort some people and explain to them about the 15 days of darkness? Oh, well, you know, I saw this article on Facebook, and uh, our friend down under um, had kind of posted it there, but I did see that he later found... I guess they're Snoops that it was uh, Snopes. Uh, Snopes, Snoops, um, Snopes that uh, it is a false article. Uh, apparently, this group claiming to be a news organization said that uh, there was going to be this alignment with the planets and it was going to create this 15 days of darkness. The reality is that when you see articles like this, we shouldn't really jump to conclusions. Always be skeptical in the sense that, um, okay, that sounds a little far-fetched. And sure enough, Serlana went online and checked it out and verified it, and, of course, it's false. So this always goes back to when you see something that seems too good to be true, definitely check uh, and make sure that, um, you know, if it's true or not before putting it out there as factual information. Um, but, uh, it, but in all fairness, our friend from Down Under, he did – verify and i saw in a later post that uh, he saw that it was it was false so you know it's so easy with these days and i've always i'm always talking to you about this or about how can you look at something and know that it, it's true or not i mean because there's so much false stories out there well it's that, easy when you got something and a claim that outrageous like no i'm gonna go look that up that can't be real the only way that would happen is if they whoever they are did something on purpose to make that happen, mm-hmm. you know, as part of, uh, you know, I don't know, some kind of scheme to get us all worked up and put us under martial law and, you know. Well, I mean. I have a very biblical mind with a conspiracy theory, how it all, it's going to break down and uh, 
I'm trying not to devolve into politics here, so. Well, it's it's so hard not to use mm-hmm. politics as an example. Um, well, I'm ha- actually going to cover that a little later here, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to get specific. I'm just sort of talking generalities, believe it or not, mm-hmm. as it pertains to how s- sci-fi, some sci-fi movies in the 80s, with a lot of them, mm-hmm. perceived the future that we're living in now. Because this is about the time frame mm-hmm. where these were set, 2017, 2019, you know, so. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's it all comes back to um, how can you believe what you see or hear? And um, you can't believe what you see it, either. It's difficult. It's it's hard to make those decisions um, on evidence that you see in front of you that, you know, this even goes back to um, what is it? The blue uh, blue blue, pro- beam? blue beam project where, you know, making you see things in the uh, atmosphere that aren't mm-hmm. true. Uh, and we were talking about in earlier. Fact, we talked about that on a previous show. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about earlier on election day. Do I call in sick on election day or the day after? Because I don't know which day that you know what may hit the fan. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, oh, you just you work in it. You work in a ground ground zero in downtown Houston. Mm-hmm. That you know I'm in the least safe place to be in the city. Yeah, I, I and and this goes back to you know you laugh and scoff at all the. Uh, Doomsday no. movies that I watch. And, I just think and, they're boring. Um, I look at it as educational. I mean, the way society breaks down and and how can you manage to, uh, you know, get home or, you know, like, for example, many times where somebody runs out of gas and what does that do? Traffic just stops because of this one person has broken down in the middle of a freeway and nobody can get through. So, one, I, I'm telling you, never take the freeway when when the S hits the when the fit hits the hand so um you know you have to plan out a different thing um and then of course if if society starts to break down it's kind of like i've told you like all right just remember just get make your way home make sure you got a bag with you or something like that that has some water and some food in it so you have enough to get yourself home so we can it takes me days to get home well think about it you're going to be walking from downtown literally if you're if the if the freeway is broken down or whatever you're talking about dro- uh, walking at least 10 miles home how fast do you think you could walk or walk home 10 miles and in the situation where society's breaking down i don't really want to think about it yeah so it, it, it's mind numbing so I, I just i'm concerned and i tell you that i do just, have two aluminum baseball bats in my car well that's a good weapon to carry you know in case i uh, could carry them cross my back like <laughs> deadpool does with his katanas <laughs> i can whip them out and just start <clears throat> breaking skulls open home run uh yeah i could see you uh post-apocalypse uh you know carrying those around and doing battle so uh, all right, so I guess what we're going to do now is that we're going to go ahead and uh, run the bumper music uh, for the mega break. And when we come back, hopefully we'll acquire our guest Mono and Taremi, and uh, we'll, we'll see and go from there. So don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. I'm from another planet. Mark your calendars. The Houston Mini Maker Fair will be at the George R. Brown Convention Center for a two-day event on November 12th and 13th. Come join them and be a part of their growth story as they boost invention and creativity through the greater Houston area by developing a world-class exhibition. Stay tuned to the official Houston Mini Maker Fair website at www.houstonmakerfair.com to hear more insights about content, schedule, tickets, and maker exhibitor registration. Hello Space Cadets. It is announcer Savannah. I want to tell you that as a dedicated member of the SBU team, you always want to look your best. Do it in a Space Boy Universe t-shirt. Get yours at SpaceBoyUniverse.com by clicking the banner on the website.
This is author Gordon Roop. You are listening to the Space Boy Universe. This is K-28, and I'm listening to Space Boy Universe. Hi, y'all. This is Lori calling from Texas, and I love listening to Space Boy Universe. Hey, this is Dave Cruz, host of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to Space Boy Universe. This is Wendy. I'm listening to Space Boy Universe. Hey, y'all. This is Lorelai Jalil. I listen to Space Boy Universe. Don't you? Tell your mom and them I said hi. The epic battle begins this Friday, 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 direct from ringside at Laser Death Meltdown. Bot versus Bot in Galaxy's Two-Ton Weight Championship, where your challenger, Good Bot, will face the ringing champion, Bad Bot. You are terminated. Reserve seating starting at $30. Two drink minimum, where ladies don't get in free. This is an SBU production. You're listening to Space Boy Universe. Explore the universe, explore the universe, spaceboyuniverse.com. Spaceboy. And since and since Sir Lana. Spaceboy. Spaceboy. And Sir Lana. Spaceboy. Spaceboy. And Sir Lana. Explore the universe with Spaceboy and Sir Lana on spaceboyuniverse.com. Hey, Sir Lana! If Space Boy Universe was cheese, would you eat it? Uh... Come on now, it's a simple question. Maybe? Spaceboyuniverse.com Techno, dance, atmospheric moods? Yes, my friends. My latest release, Digital, has something for everyone. Even makes a great gift for Grandma. Buy your digital download at spaceboymusic.com Greetings, Space Cadets. Let's see what's in the sky tonight in the Space Boy Universe. Tonight, in the eastern sky, we have Space Boy Universe rising above the horizon in glorious splendor. And in the west, we can see Solanus Majoris, which is visible at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, just below the K-28 belt. So keep your eyes on the sky and listen to Space Boy Universe. Greetings everyone. You can catch Space Boy Universe on every Saturday night at 9 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. However, we know that you might not be able to catch the live show. That is why we have many places to listen to it on demand, like iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube and Spreaker. So take the universe with you wherever you go. Call me, dial area code 7137015214. You are listening to Space Boy Universe. Here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. Yes, we're cracking up again. Uh, it's your fault this time. Thanks, James Cruz. You, you were part of our laughing crack up thing where you're space chilling and it just cracked us up. And uh, But uh, other than that... Uh, um so no call from Manu. No, uh, but we got content. That's fine. I'm I'm sure if he's going to call, he'll call in. We'll make time for him. And uh but uh, other than that, we're going to c- continue on with oh hey uh K28. Um uh let's see here. Uh where do we start? I mean, um you- just for Cake 28's edification. Yes, we will be at Houston Mini Maker Fair on the November 12th and 13th. And we will be there all day, and I want to say that goes from 10 to 5. Mm-hmm. And so we'll be broadcasting live there. Live. That, I what don't that, what that know means, what, that what means, to win. What that means is that we probably won't have our normal broadcast at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, Texas time. That uh, you'll be able to hear the replay, but during the day, if you want to tune in, you can definitely tune in. Now, also, of course, um, we will have video content that we're going to do through the course, mm-hmm. but that we will are, be much we, later when we edit it. We are going to interview someone there. I don't know if it's going to be mm-hmm. filmed or just recorded, <clears throat> but um, somebody that's going to be exhibiting on, there. And his next question is, on both days? Yep. Well, well yes, we are, both yep. days. I probably won't make it. I'll probably you know, be in the hospital by Sunday of dehydration or something. But uh, yeah, this is a big, big deal for us. So 
Yeah, we're going to cover two days. And, and you uh, know, it's that's plenty of time for you to get a plane ticket, hop on a plane, book, book a hotel, and get down to the George R. Brown Center. Let's say they overcharge you for the air, airfare. Well, we, you're not going to spend a lot of money on the tickets to get to this thing because if you go to the Mini Maker Fair, you could put in the code SPACEBOY and you'll get 50% off on the tickets. So that is really, you know, really great. Half off. Yeah, half off. And then you top that off, you get to see us live, do a live show in front, and then, you know, we might sign autographs if you're good, or we'll take some pictures, at least I will. And, yeah, he will. Yeah, and so um, the uh, lovely Serlana likes uh, to be... Uh, anonymous. Anonymous, and uh, I can respect that. I'm trying to disappear. It's, mm. it's a slow process. <clears throat> so, anyway, but yeah, Mini Maker Fair, Houston... Next month, 12th and the 13th, if you go to the site and get tickets, 50% off if you use the code SPACEBOY. All right, so here's, there's a Mini Maker Fair um, advertisement. I just wanted to clarify that for mm -hmm. Kay. Yeah. And uh, just in case, for some reason, if things don't happen tonight, just to let you know, we, we, whether we talk to you money or not, do go to thecircuitfilm.com if you can help donate to his project it's a cool project it's uh not like anything i've seen before and a lot of people from the star trek universe are involved in it and from other sci-fi tv and movie franchises are involved in it so do check that out we'll we'll let him talk more about it if he shows up if he doesn't we'll make sure to stop and discuss it so all right well so since we're talking, we were going to talk to him, and his is based around a sci-fi convention. I thought, well, let's talk about sci-fi movies. Well, we have covered it somewhat before. About a year ago, I guess it was. Yeah. yeah. So I said, let's get real specific. Let's just do the ones from the 1980s that sort of stand out. Now, this means no Back to the Future, because we've discussed it. No Star Wars. No Star Wars. No Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And we've done Aliens. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd, we're not going to do the cutesy E.T. movie either. No, I'm just, I'm just over it, you know. Okay. But, we're, but beyond that, there's still a plethora of 1980s sci-fi movies. And it was really kind of a cool time for sci-fi movies during that time. Yeah, well, that was the <laughs> thing. I, you know, I started researching this. I said, you know... Um, I, the, the ones I remember in the 80s, I was, uh, let's see, 1980, I would have been eight years old. In 1989, I would have been 16 or 17. Uh, I was 10 and 80. So that's that's the really good parts of your life right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So I, I, there were movies when I, I watched them in the theater or they came on cable. I just loved them. And I go back and try to look at them now and go, eh. <laughs> <laughs> For instance... The first one I looked at made me feel, oh, my God, you're telling me this has been 30 years ago that Weird Science weird came science. out. Oh, man, that's a classic. So I, what I've done is I looked up some trivia facts, but most of all, I, I like to talk about you more cerebral topics, but mm -hmm. we'll do that. Um, did you know that Weird Science in Japan was called Electric Venus? Really? Which I think that's a little bit more on the nose. Well, you know, it's it's that young um, men or young boys kind of fantasy film, yeah. Now, can you imagine that getting remade today? It wouldn't, because we have VR, I it think, would be easy to do. I think that uh, it would also go from what might have been a PG rating at the time to maybe an R. Um because of the subject matter. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was sort of, um, I don't know if you'd call it more towards slapstick comedy or not, but it, yeah, it's, it was, uh... there's a certain tone about sci-fi comedy movies in the day that we just don't, you won't capture anymore. And what I didn't realize is I forget that Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. was the bully. Yes. In this. And, uh, after the movie came out in the theaters, and it was about three months later, Anthony Michael Hall and Robert Downey Jr. were cast members on SNL. Were they? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, they 
also known by three names. Can you name the other, you know, since we were going down this tangent, uh, can you name another character in that show uh, that has uh, another major sci-fi? Bill Paxton. There you go. He's the older brother. Yes. And um, he had gone to get a military buzz cut, and nobody told him to do that. And they were they were thinking, well, the director's going to freak out, you know. And so he showed up on the set with his military buzz cut. Mm-hmm. And he goes, that's awesome. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> so that just sort of happened. Um, no, we're not going to talk about Ghostbusters because we've already covered it. Mm-hmm. Um, just talking to people in chat. <laughs> but Weird Science and 16 Candles, of course, Hall was in both of those, right. were both set in the fictional town of Shermer, Illinois. Okay. So you could say like you're in the same universe because you're like all. Oh, I wonder if they were, that Hall was supposed to be two different characters and that. So there was a series on TV called Weird Science. Really. And John Hughes knew nothing about it. Hmm. He had nothing to do it. He didn't know it existed. He said he was surfing cable one night and happened upon it. Now, was the TV show based upon the movie? Yes, it was. Wow. I'm going to have to research that. Yeah, I not, yeah. I, did not, I, that. I did not know that at all. I'm sure it had a, a short shelf life then. <laughs> Actually, I want to say it ran longer than you think. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get that in info down, but um, Anthony Michael Hall's drunk speech <laughs> in that bar yeah. was inspired by Richard Pryor. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did not know that either. Um, and the character Lisa was named after the first Apple computer hmm. or an early Apple computer. Hmm. So I just thought that was, you know, looking back, if you tried to show your kids that movie now, I don't think they would get it. No, it'd be. Well, you just, you had to have lived through the time, I guess. Yeah, it was one of the, it was definitely an 80s themed, uh, uh, you know, looking back kind of thing. Now, Something I've noticed when I was reading up on these things that I didn't think about back in the day, because, you know, I was a kid, um, is how they portray our future on Earth as a dystopia. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a rosy picture. And a lot of it is sort of blamed directly or obliquely on television, whether television contributed to our downfall or it's part of what's keeping us you know um incapacitated by keeping us distracted right so i never saw the movie videodrome but now i want to i read a summary about it and i remember you know hearing about it back in the day but based on what i read about it it sounds like today it sounds like the dark web today if the dark web was part of a conspiracy Mm -hmm. um but that's something I wondered if that could be remade, well, but I, now it, you turn it into the dark web. I think it's interesting uh, because, you know, basically it was about uh, a TV station worker uh, that stumbles into a global conspiracy of mind control videos. I guess you could do it like, you know, how you have uh, On Demand where it could be a popular On Demand channel on Roku and uh, when you click the videos and... Uh, um, you know, it just brainwashes you into thinking, you know, uh, whatever. And this movie was, you know, I was fairly young to watch this. But this movie, I shouldn't have been watching. That was the, kind of like a trend back in the 80s. A young kid, such as myself, watching movies that I really shouldn't be watching, and but yet I was watching. And this one was just really uh, just kind of like, it's just hard to put into words. Yeah, other than the synopsis I read thought, like, well, I need to see this. I'm going to try to look that up and try to find it. Um, there's a lot of people mentioning they're mentioning sci-fi movies, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. <laughs> well, I want to I want to point out real quick that it, it this movie starred James Woods, mm-hmm. uh, I believe Sonia Smith and Blondie. Uh, the singer, uh, yeah, that, yeah that we, you know, it's that, very pop culture heavy, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was, I guess it takes place in that early '80s, so I can imagine Deb, uh, Deborah Harry being in there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like I said, you know, ooh, James Woods, piece of candy. So yeah, it was really kind of bizarre. It's kind of a, a I don't want to say a obscure movie, but it's definitely one that 
you know, could be remade today because, like I said, you have the global conspiracy, the mind control videos, uh, political intrigue, and, you know, uh, it's just, it's definitely one on my list that I would love to revisit because I haven't seen it in a long time. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I, I definitely want to check that out. Now, another one that I did see, you said you didn't have anything to comment on it about, was uh, Altered States. Well, and, I, I, I think what I like about that movie is ha it has that, uh, I can't think of her name, but she was in Fringe. Um, and, uh, but, I know you're talking about. And I'm trying to think of, the uh, was it Hurt? William Hurt? Yes. Yes, William Hurt was the main person. It's a trippy movie. Um, uh, it's kind of like a an evolution type movie. But he got way. into like a float tank or a something? A float tank, which is bizarre because you get this fringe connection again. Yeah, well, look, it's weird. While you were talking about DC and Marvel, and I sort of just I, I blanked out mm -hmm. because I was reading something. <laughs> um, sure. I just saw this article about um, this woman in the article's titled To Float or Not to Float. And uh, it's basically like you say the fringe thing where you it's heavy salt water and it's a tank and they close the lid on you and it's dark and they play music and this this girl's like do I really want to do this it seems kind of hokey I gotta pay ninety dollars to do this you know and she said that it wasn't radical and she went back like three or four times mm -hmm. um, but she had one revelation and she she uh, got rejuvenated mm -hmm. the feeling uh it actually gave her a sense of true calmness but that's just going in and floating in a tank whereas altered states would involve psychedelic drugs mm -hmm. and you know he was trying to reach a different state of consciousness to try to maybe transform or something and it was right. and he did and it was freaky it's one of those things that it's it's not so scary as it's a psychological thriller. Yeah, and there were a lot of those back uh, late 70s, early 80s, and this one ties mm -hmm. into that theme, like The Howling, um, you know, and uh, some other movies that, you know, kind of the, the cat people and uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of lead into cat the... Cat people, my well, mother was in that Yeah, <laughs> so, which that has a David Bowie connection. Yeah, so, yeah. But um, you have, yeah, so Altered States is just another one in those dots uh, that of the that... That vein of of uh, I was going to say music of movies that came out like that. Mm -hmm. Now this one you can commentate on because I know I watched Blade Runner back in the day, like mm -hmm. on cable, but I've not seen it since I was a teenager. Believe it or not, I've not gone back and tried mm -hmm. to sit down and watch it. Um, so I went and looked it up, and I couldn't spark any memories. But the only thing I remember about it is I couldn't understand it because I was probably too young. Mm -hmm. But I did find some facts. Maybe you can comment on this. Ridley Scott says that Rick Deckard is a replicant. Well, that's the theory that's out there. Um, but and, and, but uh, uh, Harrison Ford says differently. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. until we get the, the, which there is going to be a sequel to this. First off, it's based off of the Philip K. Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream Electric Sheep? Um, and, um, so it follows, like you said, Harrison Ford as a, as a replicant hunter in the year 2019 of all things, yeah. which, is, which is kind of funny, you know? So it's in other words, it's, it's 2016. So we we should be getting androids by 2019. Uh, so that's exciting. <clears throat> and, uh, basically, um, he finds these androids that I guess it, they, he kills them because of, they came. They came from somewhere else, didn't they? They came to Earth. No, they they were produced by uh, Wayland. Wayland, Waylon, yes. Which you take that, there, and you have the connection back to Alien, alien. and uh, so uh, they're all a part of the same universe, and um, and so, but yeah. Uh, oh, the only thing I just remembered. The only thing I remember about this movie is that they had light up umbrellas. That's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another one would be for me, Daryl Hannah in her black eye makeup, and uh, <clears throat> she uh, should always her, wear that. Her searching out for this guy that uh, helped create these uh, robots or androids, and he had all these toys that were uh, kind of that you know robotic toys that were interactive. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just a really interesting. Uh, 
uh, film, to say the least, um, because it's. I think it's pretty visually stunning. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes from definitely during that time where you you thought that the Japanese were going to overwhelm the United States and with their technology. And oh, stuff. that comes from that. Okay, real world paranoia, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you see that, I guess, in different things. But um, so you see an infusion of uh, Asian culture in uh, actually. Yeah, Mexican. that's what I remember. Like the city scenes mm-hmm. was. It seemed more like what you'd see over there right. at night in Japan. So it had this infusion of, and that wasn't the only movie that had this 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 feel and look of you know the Japanese because during the eighties you know there was a big Japanese influence mm-hmm. um, in our in the culture of you know because you had Walkmans, you had all oh, this yeah. technology, had my and uh, I mean even and I don't want to go back to Back to the Future and. Uh, when Marty says, well, all the best stuff comes from Japan. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, a lot of the technology we were getting uh, was coming so from, yeah, from Japan and, and, you know, just influencing our, our culture in general. But uh, that's why you see movies like Blade Runner that has that feel and look of the future where that culture has overwhelmed us and then become part of America. And then also even south of the border comes a part of the culture because you have character uh james almost who plays a character in this movie uh and you get the feeling he's talking a mix between uh, japanese and and spanish and and it's just really interesting interesting yeah um i know that um oh what's his face the Tears in the Rain speech, oh, he yeah. improvised that. I, and, and it's a classic. It's a because classic Because he thought line. the script that he was, the words he was giving the script were just no good. I've seen things. And I can't remember the exact line, but uh, off the shoulder of the... I know they were making fun of it in Venture Brothers. But still, it's, it's, it's really kind of, uh, as far as a death scene goes, and um, I mean, he knows he's dying, and then he, and this, it's so poetic, the what he quotes, and, and then he just... He dies, and then you see this dove kind of go off, like if it's his soul going off into heaven. So yeah, that is one, what, one of my favorite scenes out of that. What really threw me off was I found out that Dustin Hoffman was going to play the lead role. Really, and, and he dropped and Blade, out. Uh, well, yes. Uh, well, uh, thank goodness because uh, you know, not that he can't do a serious uh, no, acting, but, but he just strikes me as goofy. Rutger Howard did an awesome job of that that particular role well and no i think hoffman was going to be harrison ford oh harrison ford's mm-hmm. character i don't know i think harrison ford i mean i think it even he I had mean, the right level of coolness him, for it sean young um you know rutger howard um and then howard, uh, howard yes um and uh um i can't think of her name i just mentioned yeah. earlier but all the characters that were in this movie were spot on and um I can't imagine anybody else playing these characters. So tell me, what's the thing in this movie about the voiceover? There's a controversy about there was a voiceover added so that the movie could be easier to follow because test audience hated the film and they didn't know what was going on. Maybe So see, was it just me? But then it was removed in the director's cut and final versions. Um, I haven't really heard anything about that, but I, I can only imagine since there, you know, there's a lot of points where there's not much dialogue Mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it, to me, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about it, it sounds like, you know, I'm a big Bogart fan. And when he plays these detectives, you know, he'll do these voiceovers, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was last Thursday when I saw the perpetrator come in and uh, I watched him and followed him. So he, he's kind of like narrating what he's doing. So, because if you took the narration out, you're like, okay, what's he doing? You know, he's looking at this guy, but, you know. So I imagine that uh, they put this narration in to, to mimic the old detective movies um, where, you know, there was this dialogue that went over to kind of help the audience f- uh, follow along with what was going on. So, Yeah, uh, like I said, it's been so long since I've seen it. Uh, now, do you know anything about the curse of Blade Runner? Mm, hit me up. I think this is kind of lame for a curse. It says, but the Blade Runner had a curse that apparently all the businesses that you see in the movie, like the logos, Atari, Pan Am, RCA, Cuisinart, Bell Phones, all suffered severe business problems 
shortly after Blade Runner's release, as did Coca-Cola with their new Coke. And members of the Blade Runner production team refer to it as the Blade Runner product placement curse. I haven't heard that, but that is I, It's kind of silly. Uh, it's almost like um, going back to 2001 Space Odyssey when you have Pan Am. Uh huh. Um, you know they were. You know. Um, you know. It's one of those companies you think will be on be with us forever. And even uh, South. Uh, even Bell it has Bell, Bell Telephone. Yeah. Um, of course, we know how all that went down. But um, yeah, it's. But as far as the ba- uh, um, uh, uh, Blade Runner movie, that's interesting. Now we're going to talk about one of your favorites. You should be able to expound upon this easily. Okay. In case you're wondering, we're actually having a legit conversation because I did not tell him about any of this mm-hmm. content <laughs> beforehand. So it would be more organic. We're going to talk about Tron. Oh, yes, Tron. I found out that Tron was not universally adored. <laughs> not even by the people who were wanting to make it. That... um Traditional Disney animators mm-hmm. felt threatened by computer technology, and they thought they were going to make them obsolete, and they refused to to assist in making of Tron. Right. So the director, Sid Mead, and French artist Jean Mobius Giraud designed the costumes and storyboarded <laughs> the film. Mm-hmm. So in order to get that style of the you know the first Tron, that lighted up look, it was a multi-layer process, and um, they only use computer graphics for backgrounds and the light cycle races. Right. The rest, I guess, like all the things that were lit that looked like luminous, mm-hmm. was traditional animation techniques. They're hand painted, right? Cell by cell, I guess, or frame by frame. I think that they had it in black and white, and then they went back in and colored it. Um, to my knowledge, that that's how they did it. Now, this is what just kills me looking back from today's technology and standpoint. So Jeff Bridges and David Warner had to perform against a black screen so they could put the virtual sets, Mm -hmm. drop them in behind. Right. And to make the computer generated images, they needed a computer that used two megabytes of memory, (laughs) but 330 megabytes of hard drive storage space. It's uh, interesting to think, uh, you know. I sent a video file that was bigger than both of those the other day. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 you know, like I said, this movie. Uh, or what I'm about to say is, it came out in '82. Yes. Um, so that should give you an idea of the perspective of uh, of when this movie came out and the technology that they used to create um, the computer graphics and. Um, uh, so, but as far as overall, it's, it's, you know, it didn't do very well, Mm-mm. uh, in the box office, which kind of really surprised me because as a kid, it was a different, uh, it was really different. I, I, it was different. It, it was unique and, uh, spectacular. Um, you, because computers were starting to invade the home now. You just came out, out, out the movie that, uh, it gets associated with Tron is the black hole, the mm-hmm. Disney's black hole. So this I, is Disney. I, I, yeah, I, you, you, as a kid, I saw that movie, and then within months, I saw Tron, and and I was thinking, wow, this is great, this is awesome. I want to get into computers, and that's what I was getting at. Was at that point was computers really cool? I would love to be trapped in a computer and play virtual games like that and you know not now you're just trapped in a computer yeah now i'm just trapped in a computer without the fun um so but yeah so the idea of you know of everything that went down because you know it starts off and you have flynn who's trying to uh uh hack into the system to prove that uh, his ideas have been stolen from him um and then they flash into the computer world where the flynn virtual character uh, I guess his whatever his program is is trying to find that information, and then later on they end up in the arcade that he owns, which is really cool. Because if if you as a millennial, if you've never experienced, and I'm not talking about Dave and Buster's or any of these other arcades. Chuck e. Cheese. Back in the day, it was a wonderful feeling to go into an arcade 
with all these th- all these different games and the sounds, and then on top of that, they would be playing modern music uh, of that time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ranging. We'll never get that back. And yeah, it's it's just quite a feeling. So if you ever want to experience a part of that, you know, watch that part of Tron. Um, but uh, I think it just it. Every time I, I think of this movie, it just warms my heart because it's <laughs> it's a special thing. Because I it love inspired, 1982, the inspired, year. Inspired, uh, you know, me as far as getting into technology. Now, what's great about this movie is that even though it did not do well in the box office, um, it did uh, receive some nominations for Best Costume, Best Sound at the 55th, Cat- uh, I guess it was the 55th Academy Awards. And it did uh, and received the uh, award for technical achievement. Really? For, yeah, 14 years later. Can you believe that? Because I read the Academy Awards of 1983 snubbed them well, for best visual effects because they considered it cheating. Yeah, it's special effects. Um, but they, for 14 years later, they, they did uh, get the award for uh, um, technical achievement. 14 years later. Um, but That's strange. It is strange. So go figure. Um, and it also spawned, because we wanted it so badly, kids of my generation, uh, we got the 2010 sequel titled Tron Legacy, uh, which um, had Daft Punk score the film, which I think was perfect. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, in fact, I think the uh, Boston Globe ranks this particular film uh, 13th in the uh, 2010 list of top 20 cult films of all times. And it deserves to be recognized as an achievement. Um, it, I think it's just the Academy was old school during the time when this movie came out. It was too new. It was and, just too new, It was new, too new, too avant-garde. And um, I think where it hit uh, in the right spot was the kids of my age of that time. Did you know that the whole, um, what, what what you got there? What? Well, it's top of the hour, so let's, okay. let's take a quick break. Okay. Sorry, Sir Lana. I know. No she, problem. You know, we we'll get come j- back. Both of us get so jazzed when we're talking about this stuff. So, but anyway, you're listening to Space Boy Universe with that Sir Lana by. and Space Boy. So don't touch that dial.
you are listening to Space Boy Universe. Now here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. Indeed it is. I am Space Boy, and who are you? I'm still Solana. Oh, and the lovely Solana you are. So you are listening to Space Boy Universe Network. If, settle on that one for a while, Space Cadets, and wonder what I just said. So where were we, Solana? You were about to talking about Tron. Tron. So I was just wondering Tron if session. you knew these facts because I know you're a hardcore original Tron fan. Well, I, I enjoy a good movie. <laughs> Did you know that those uh, flying discs were part of the uh, no guns policy? Really? Yeah. Um, it was an intentional choice by the part of Lisberger, who was uh, involved with the film. They wanted the film to distance himself from violent imagery that kids might consider emulating at home. So instead, let's throw frisbees at people and try to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> that something? Yeah. Did you know that Don Bluth was an animator at Disney? Yes. And he defected from the company in 1979 mm-hmm. and publicly chastised Disney as being stale. And he was set to release his Secret of Nim in July of that year. Tron's release date was removed up to July 9th. And eight, I guess, 82. I mean, we're talking 82, Secret of Nim. Right. Uh, was moved up to July 9 in hopes it would crush Don Blue's project. And Secret of Nim made 14 million, Tron made 33. Oh, secret- but neither was considered a runaway hit. But Secret of Nim is still also a classic, yeah. too, as well. It's, it's um, uh, freaky, but. And Blue uh, went on to do uh, video games as well. Um, do you know which video games that he did? Yeah, but I can't think of name. I can see the cover art. Uh, There's two. One's a space and one's sort of like a knight. Well, you got half of it. Space Ace, which was mm-hmm. uh, the second one. But he did uh, Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair. Where he, it, was a, it was an animated adventure where but you had to move. move what? That, those two games were awesome. I, going back to the arcade, because I mentioned the arcade earlier, I remember hearing, you know, that thing was loud when you you could hear... Uh, Dragon's Lair because you know it'd go into this repeat thing and you know just I know how you love things that go into these repeat modes and uh, between that and uh, in the arcade I'd love to go into that one and then play uh, Spy Hunter which was right next yeah, to Spy Hunter Dra- right Dragon's Lair in this particular arcade I'd go into but anyway yeah Bluth he's responsible for that he's also responsible for doing an animated sequence in the movie Xanadu talk about movies that don't, oh wow that don't fare well after so many years that was yeah, a, one yeah. of another movie I liked as a kid but doesn't matter uh, but still like music it music great um, but uh, the, uh, the movie itself eh, it didn't hold yeah. too well well so. it's a musical sometimes yeah. they're not you know it was, I guess it was the continuation <clears throat> of that Olivia Newton-John thing but you know. yeah yeah so anyway did you know that Tron inspired Pixar Really? Well, I could. I guess I could see that, yeah. Pixar uh, animation specialist John Lasseter mm-hmm. was a young storyboard artist at Disney when Tron was in development. Hmm. So he caught a glimpse of that production, and it consti- he, he convinced that studio to give him a 30-second test reel featuring CGI backgrounds. They liked it, but they were more interested in saving money than fostering his new ideas. Mm-hmm. But he didn't let that bother him. He... Uh, he blew, he uh, <clears throat> came back in 2012, mm-hmm. and uh, he said a little door in his mind opened up, and he says, this is it. This is the future, and there's Pixar. And proof positive, you know, Pixar has produced many great shows, and and he's been the one to spearhead that, uh, that whole operation. I just think that was interesting that he got sparked to want to do CGI off of Tron, and they're like, well, that's nice, but we can't do that. It's too expensive. Well, like I said, there were many people, I mean, since he, you know, that's one thing to be actually working on a project like that, which that must have been awesome. But, mm-hmm. you know, like going back to impressionable kids, you know, during this time, you, you get Tron, you've got the beginning of, a uh, well, midpoint of Atari and video games and everything's just... You got the arcades. I mean, it was just such a wonderful time mm-hmm. for that kind of... that that thing and uh, to inspire uh, kids of my age that are now uh, my age now who have money and have made 
you know, the uh, I guess the video game uh, video game empire, mm -hmm. billions of dollars that have poured into that. Many people playing video games, um, and um, you know, just movies that are CGI and. So and you would have been the guy who would have loved the last Starfighter. Oh, that's just another classic, and you know, as far as because one, you're talking about another thing where it was a video game set up to recruit for the uh they could totally remake that now couldn't yeah, they? They, with virtual reality i guess and, they know. could you know and uh um it had one of my favorite actors in it uh, robert uh, preston? preston yes from the music man the music man uh, and uh uh, he, I think he was the perfect kind of person. Who showed for up in a souped-up looking DeLorean-esque vehicle? Uh -huh. They could fly, uh, could fly again. And when you're dealing with another movie, we're dealing with the CGI thing, mm -hmm. and, and they, I thought it was well done. And that's one another one of those movies. All computer generated that, effects. Exactly. And it had fun uh, watching and just. I to still like that. I mean, I don't know if we have it on DVD or not. Or I, um, I think we do. It's probably in a DVD. I think it might be Blu-ray. We we've packed away all the DVDs because yeah, it just doesn't seem like any point when you've got your on demand Roku stuff. box and yeah. you know. But that that movie had a ho hum release back in its day. Mm -hmm. But what really helped gain a following was the constant replay on cable in the right. 80s and 90s and so home video vhs releases so it's not brought up a lot when you talk about the best films of the 80s or thing but when you mention it to other people they all say they just sort of light up like oh yeah i love that movie and there is a remake being talked about mm -hmm. but they talked about it in 2015 right but not even Steven Spielberg could get the rights to it. Well, who's holding the rights? Who's right? holding the rights? You may well ask. The writer, Jonathan Betul. I'm not sure if that's, it's B-E-T-E-U-L. <laughs> I hope that's not a pun either, so. That's his name. He doesn't have any interest in seeing his film remade. Hmm. But in 2015, summer 2015, he was in talks to create a Last Starfighter TV series. Mm -hmm. It was going to be called the Starfighter Chronicles, but it was not going to be a remake and it was not going to be a continuation. It's going to be something New. based on that, but different. Huh. Where is it now? Don't know. But it was not going to be just a TV series. There was going to be a virtual reality interactive experience to go with it. Mm -hmm. It was very ambitious. But where is it now? Damn it, heard. So they don't, no one's sure how that would work out, but somebody pointed out if anyone is going to make an interesting take on virtual reality in film, it's going to be Spielberg's adaptation of Ready Player One. Yes, and that's in production. Mm -hmm. uh, and this goes back to the Gene Hackman story uh, that has plagued me since almost the dawning of Space Boy Universe. Um, Gene Wilder... It supposedly has voiced some things for that movie. And then he passed and, away. And then he passed away. So Gene Wilder <laughs> is going to be in that movie. And I, I, I believe I have the, I have the book mm -hmm. that I got from a Loot Crate thing. Mm -hmm. And then I have it on Kindle. And I just haven't broke it down. And, and got I know into because that. it's an infamous book. No, it has nothing to do with that. It, it has everything <laughs> to do with uh, just timing, you know, you know, with me. Um, you know, I still make an attempt to I listen to audiobooks. I know it's not the same as visually looking at something, but at least I'm still, you know, like if I'm driving, you know, I'll listen to an audiobook too because I have uh, plenty of time on my hands to get home from work now. Yeah. And so, but anyway, I digress. Just know that... We won't get into that. I'll yeah. just... I'll go into ranting Ooh. about traffic. <laughs> Don't get me started. No, we will not get him started. Lord. Um, another movie I liked, I'll just mention it briefly, it wasn't a lot to, to, to find out about it, was, um, I suppose this was for kids, The Explorers. Oh, yeah. It's a good movie. And it's it's one... it's. More obscure, obscure mm -hmm. from back in the day. Yeah. But there are loads of them that were, you know. I, I looked at a whole list of just sci-fi movies that came out between 80 and 89. And I'm like, what is that? Never heard of that. Never heard of that. So, um, But I like to, I still like to go back and watch this one. Although it, it goes from 
interesting to a little bit goofy. Yeah, you know, it goes the, the, the goes al- off the deep end with the goofiness. aliens. Yeah, in they're the movie goofy. Are kind of goofy, but uh, um, but the yeah, like when they're building the ship. Um, that was all interesting. That was all interesting because you didn't know what was going on, what was going on. Yeah. But uh, just some backstory, few things I found out. Um, River Phoenix played the nerdy kid. He didn't want to play the nerd kid. He wanted to be the cool kid. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know how mean, he ended up being the nerd. I mean the cool kid like hanging out with the space cadets at the uh, the chat room? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and Ethan Hawke, he played the, you know, the, the guy who was having all these um, dreams and these signals were being right. sent to him. And he, he had a crush on the girl next door. Well, he got that part accidentally. He did not go to audition for it. He went with a friend who was there to audition. And he was just hanging out. And I don't know, somehow they just liked his vibe and they had him audition and uh, he did know about movie making and how to hit his marks, but he had never acted before and it was his first film and the crew was like, you're not going to hire a kid who's never acted before, but I don't think you'd know it from looking at that movie. All right. So that's how he became an actor. I've always found, and he's he's been in many other sci-fi adventures, um, uh, Gattaca was another one, which is Never a good saw one. It. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to think of this one that I saw recently where he's kind of a time traveler, hmm. and that is really talk about being your own grandpa thing. I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna have to dig that one up for you. And okay, to, but yeah, uh, it's definitely an interesting one. Well, uh, the director was Joe Dante for this film, and he said there is a lot of the film that's missing. It's on the cutting room floor, never to be seen again. They wanted to push another early re- release date. So they had to just take out a bunch. There's a backstory about bullies at their school, the three boys, that they um, go back and kind of get revenge because they have these extra abilities because of their time when they were visiting the aliens. Mm-hmm. And they said on set, uh, River Phoenix and Ethan Hawke had a rivalry for the the girl that played the you know the crush the next door neighbor crush, and she went on to be the girl who played in Can't Buy Me Love. Huh. So I thought that was pretty cute, but uh, that was just one I happen to like. Uh, another one that I think does get mentioned, and maybe you oh. might think it's heavy handed. I just remembered uh, the movie is called. Predestination with Ethan Hawke. If, okay. If, I, I just bring it up now because if any of the uh, space cadets uh, hear this, definitely check it out. It's very interesting, and the twist in this movie is, I mean, you just have to watch it. It's just really cool. Predestination with Ethan Hawke. Anyway, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, another one I, I enjoyed back in the day, but I have not seen it in a very long time, is Enemy Mine. Hmm. With, you know, Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr. Yeah, it's a great movie. And um, it basically does in, what, two hours what Star Trek does over how many series and movies. Yes. Um, it takes two two races that mm-hmm. supposedly hate each other. Or have been Darmok known. and Jalad. Yeah. At Tanagra. Basically, it's Darmok and Jalad right. at Tanagra, right. except there's no goodwill at the beginning. Right. Um, they face a common circumstance Mm -hmm. they're both trapped and together in a place they can't get away and they have to help each other survive eventually Mm -hmm. and you know he ends up they end up being like roommates in a way and they learn to overcome all their prejudices and you know of course the the male alien is the one that has the baby Mm -hmm. so he was pregnant you know that freaks out the human so and he ends up raising the baby ends up raising the the thing and um the alien baby and the, somehow they get rescued they take the alien away from him they were going to I don't know if they were going to kill it or use it to, for well, some other reason well they were using it for uh, well apparently on uh, their slave labor yeah their slave labor yeah. when they capture him so that's probably why they were fighting him mm-hmm. and then he has to go rescue it and I think it, it, it ends wonderfully because uh, you have Randy uh, Quaid uh, no uh, Dennis, Dennis Quaid Pff, there I go we again we don't know where Randy is uh, yeah it, uh, off the deep end Dennis Quaid ends up going to the home planet of these aliens uh, to uh, I guess give because they all get together to do blessings or whatever mm-hmm. and 
and kind of a spiritual thing and, mm-hmm. and he, he shows up he shows up and he i guess they kind of like the kids bar mitzvah and, or something. And, and they respect him because you know he one i guess he rescued these aliens and uh and then i guess he ends up creating peace between the humans and these aliens like Spock wanted to do yeah. with the Romulans and the Vulcans. So it, this is definitely a movie. If you haven't seen on the, on the good scale, it's it's up there. And, it's good. And it's something that uh, you should definitely revisit if you get a chance. Now we're going to talk about something you can really get into. Uh-oh. Now, I like this movie because looking back at it now from this perspective it feels like an independent gritty under budget film that you can really (laughs) get into and it it was sort of different for the time Mm -hmm. let's see if you know what i'm talking about okay uh it was directed by james cameron Uh uh-huh continue i'm 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 guessing here well keep keep me and um he had this because he was inspired by a fever dream he had about a metal death figure um could it be uh uh terminator the terminator (laughs) yes it is a great movie and you're absolutely right the original terminator had this independent feel to it and Mm -hmm. uh you know compared to i I think dark the whole movie was like not lit right it it was dark. dark Well, it takes place at nighttime in yeah. Los Angeles. That's what really I and, remember about it. And yeah. nudity. Uh, well, yeah. Some Schwarzen- nice, Schwarzen- well built naked men. Schwarzenegger butt, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Well, the other guy was nude too, but we didn't get to see anything, uh, yeah, did we? Yeah, I don't recall that much. Uh, and not saying that I'm focusing on Schwarzenegger. Had a better agent. But, yeah. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> apparently, the Terminator supposedly is a ripoff. Of an episode of The Outer Limits from 1964 called what? The Soldier. Really? Or just Soldier. So apparently, I didn't know this, James Cameron was a bit of a butthead, <laughs> we'll say. <laughs> and I don't know if he's softened up over time, but back then he was quite the butthead. Now, we had a discussion earlier about this because mm-hmm. uh, you had asked me or told me a little bit about that. And and I came back at you in the sense that, you know, James Cameron is a perfectionist. He He's a man who knows what he wants to do. And when somebody comes along to interfere... So that gives you an excuse to be a butthead? Uh, it, it, there... The reality is, there's no excuse for That's the being, kindest way I can put for, it for being uh, a jerkosaurus. But the fact is that you know, on one end, okay, uh, I guess what I'm coming to the rescue uh, with James Cameron is that uh, I understand <laughs> when you have a vision and you don't want to break from that vision and you want to create something look you don't have to tell me <laughs> i work with you every day about with your quote unquote vision look and there's times you, when i have to take it where you put your you vision would just give me a snickers bar uh, i probably uh, would just i wouldn't be so uh, diva ish in in my if it was look if it was that simple i would but you being diabetic i don't think that's the right thing to do well the thing is that it would shut me up and uh you know uh it would give you an opportunity to kick me uh while i would be on the floor and you know so but the thing is going back to the james cameron thing is i understand he's a perfectionist um i know that he's trying to he's got an idea for his art and he, he doesn't want to compromise so when people Say, uh, you know, let's do it this way. Like, no, this is what I want to do. Well, maybe that's different when you've got people on, on the set that you've paid to be there. But yeah. when you're doing I, it to your wife and she's not being paid. Look, let's not get back to me, even though I'm sure you probably think that I would love to talk about me at this point. But yeah, uh, the thing is that you're... You can, but then I'll tell, tell you what, the, tell the uh, listeners the other side of the story. The thing is that he pro- pays people... And he's expecting them to do what he's asking them to do. And, I mean, if I'm paying somebody to do something, and, you know, I might get angry if they're not doing it or even, you know, performing it the I way I need to do I think he just straight up fired people. Well, anyway, so. Uh, well, he sold the script for Terminator for mm-hmm. $1. Did you know that? Sold it to where? To whom? He only had one directing experience to his name by the time he got to Terminator. Yeah. Piranha 2, The Spawning. What? Mm-hmm. 
It's the only film he had directed previously. Uh, I remember him directing that, now that I think about it, but uh, it just... He was trying to get a Terminator made. Right. So he just sold it for $1 to this lady producer, and he says, I'll sell the script to you for $1, but I have to direct it. That's how he got. So he directed it. He sold it for one hundred, but the rights will go back to him in twenty nineteen. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, I wonder what he, you know, with all, you know, with Terminator Three, Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis. Um, which, incidentally, I did like Genesis. It wasn't that bad. Uh, but I didn't see anything after Terminator Two. Uh, that gets me into the topic of uh, it doesn't do dom- do well domestically, but uh, worldwide it does phenomenally. It made it money back. So uh, I don't know which which guy was Lance Henriksen. Well, in this particular one, the best quick way to know who he is is to go back to the movie James Cameron directed, and that is Aliens. He played Bishop, the android, okay. the android. Now, in this movie, Terminator, uh, he plays a cop, and you know. Okay. But uh, I don't want to steal your thunder. So, do you want to tell? Says he made an impression before they started filming mm-hmm. by kicking open a door and acting the title character, the Terminator, mm-hmm. while wearing a leather jacket with gold foil smothered on his teeth, and his rep- performance was so believable. The secretary. <laughs> dropped her typewriter onto her lap, but Hendrickson would only play the detective for his trouble. And, and which is interesting is that there's he probably done it. There's artwork where James Cameron designed, which showed his character Lance um, mm-hmm. as the Terminator. Mm-hmm. And he could have done it. I'm sure he could have done it because uh, he's a gravitas. Yeah, he's got uh, the uh, the gravitas, as you say, but to, to do it. Arnold has the muscles and the lack of communication skills. The thing is that uh, he looks like a machine. Yeah. I mean, he, he Arnold did. pulls he really it off did. as a machine. And so it's kind of hard. Uh, I I think it was just meant to be for Arnold for mm-hmm. that. Well, the studio only had two notes for Cameron while they were shooting this. Strengthen the relationship between Sarah and Kyle, which he did. Mm-hmm. Did he? And then he kind of ignored their second suggestion. Get a cyborg canine companion for the Terminator. Thank God they didn't. Like uh, canine? Yeah, like canine. Uh, here's a little bit of, uh, what, would you call this irony? But they do, in the movie, utilize the, the, the dog in a way because the uh, the dog it, it detects you know even when you find out later in the other movies they're kind of like uh, they know they can sense that maybe that's they, a throwback they, to that yeah it could be maybe that's an Easter egg yeah so um now I don't know if you call this irony or not uh, one person that was suggested to play the Terminator before Schwarzenegger was O J Simpson mm-hmm. which no, I, Cameron rejected because he thought O J was too nice. <laughs> Should have gave him a pair of gloves. If the movie don't fit, you have to acquit. So anyway, um, yeah, good thing they didn't go with that because there would be uh, we'd be boned as far as sequels were concerned. <laughs> yeah. Um, now Arnold didn't want to play the Terminator because he's the villain. Because uh, he just came off a successful movie, Conan the Barbarian, where he was the hero. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to ruin that success he kind of had going, that gravy right. train. But he eventually agreed. But uh, another guy they wanted to play to play the Terminator, maybe, was Sting. Really? They offered him $350,000. Wow. No, to play Kyle, not not the Terminator. I was the say, Kyle. Kyle? Kyle now, Reese. Now, that would have been interesting. That would have been believable. Gonna... But he was already committed to Dune. Mm-hmm. Lucky him. <laughs> well, speaking of Dune. Dune. Dune? Not Doom. Doom? Well, we're doomed for a, a break here. <laughs> well, these are coming up fast. Well, we're trucking along. It's easy when you have subject matter to talk about. I have even more than this. Well, stand by and we'll talk more. And you're listening to Space Boy Universe with Sir Lana and Space Boy. <laughs>
Electric 100, one of the many songs that you could possibly hear on a Wednesday night on Space Boy Music. That's right. Space Boy p- pulls music out of his vault, and he plays it for you. That's every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, and I know you're getting choked up over I'm there. I'm glad that you're only pulling it out of your <laughs> vault. The vault, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. There could be other locations, but for now, it's the vault. So we're coming back, and uh, we still talking Terminator. Not the Terminator, yeah. Just yes. a couple more things. Um. So when he finally did get the role, after they went through all these people that, for some reason or other, didn't want to be in the film or couldn't mm-hmm. be in the film, Arnold did not think he could pronounce the contraction "I'll" as in "I'll be back." So he said. He'll, he was going to change it to I will be back because he didn't think cyborgs would use contractions mm-hmm. or Data. I will return. Data. Yeah. So, um, cause, so he didn't think he could pronounce it because he's, you know, he's, uh, is he what, Belgian? Um, Aus- Austrian, Aus- Austrian. 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 Yeah. So that was kind of probably a hard to, for him to pronounce. Mm-hmm. But Cameron said, hey, man, I don't tell you how to act. You don't tell me how to write. And I'm like, well, somebody should tell Arnold how to act. I mean, <laughs> I mean ain't that a director's job? I mean, so one last tidbit about The Terminator. In Poland, the film was called The Electronic Murderer. Really? Because the word Terminator for Terminator loosely translates to mean apprentice. That's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? So... Just some things that I didn't know. And I just, like I said, I like to go watch that movie. There's certain movies, like, I'll watch it every ten, once every ten years because, you know, I just like it. So, 
Next one I want to go into is another Arnold film. He seems to have been in a lot of the sci-fis, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's another one that is sort is, of a commentary on... Oh, so it's not... Get to the chopper! It's not that one. No. Oh, that's Predator, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, just checking. But this one is like a social commentary on uh, mm-hmm. our future. And it is The Running Man. No, awesome. not the dance move. Oh, the was, Running Man movie. And I was so ready to bust out my dance moves right now so you could take a picture for the Space Cadets. I'll I'll throw these headsets <laughs> down and do it now if you'll do it. <laughs> you you know what it is. You know how to do it, right? Yeah, I know how to I know how to do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. I mean, I may be old, but I could still cut a rug every once in a while. Okay. All right. So. But this movie back in the day was sort of goofy, sort of cheesy, I thought. But now looking back at it, it's starting to make sense. That what, just uh, sort of the weird thing, and you know? I know? Yeah, I know you're going to bring this up, but it, it centers around a television show that airs in what year? You are cheating. <laughs> Wait a minute. Stop, stop, stop. You are straight up cheating. You don't have notes. You are looking at IMBD as I'm t- as I'm mentioning okay, the name of the titles. Off, you simmer down, cheater, and get to your point. You're cheating, you're cheating, it's, you're cheating. Get to the point. So the point is, I feel like this is kind of where we're headed as a society. We're sort of making a mockery of our own elections now. So why not chase people to their death for entertainment? You know, you've got in the movie, you've got this evil government that distracts the masses with manipulated media and death matches and it takes place in the year 2017 where the economy has collapsed food oil and natural resources are in short supply people are fighting over food in the streets it's a police state and it's divided into like military zones Mm -hmm. and it has Gripping performances and appearances by Dweezil Zappa and Mick Fleetwood because that's what the 80s had to offer. Did you bring up Richard Dawson? No, he played himself pretty much. Pretty much. And for those kids out there, Richard Dawson uh, used to be a game show host uh, for uh, the... That liked to molest women on camera. <laughs> well, anyway, he had to get a peck in every once in a while. But uh, what's, what's the name of that game show? The Family Feud. Yeah, yes, and it, and we can go back even further than that. Mm-hmm. He played a Frenchman in what? Uh, I guess it was a '60s show. '60s show. It was a '60s show. You I believe. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Hogan's Heroes. Okay. Yeah. So going way back in the day. So he's. See, I he's, never watched. He, he's Hogan's had Heroes. a long career, you know, here, there, and everywhere. But uh, I think his prime was uh, hosting Family Feud. Yeah, um, and this this movie also had music by Harold Faltermeyer. If you know that name, it's because you know the song Axel F. Mm-hmm. And he also, oh, Harold uh, did other music during the 80s, too, as well. So it at least had a good music score, but mm-hmm. um, this is one of those movies that my friend Holly and I would rent for like a dollar back, way back in the day, you know, and we'd just watch it. Before Mystery Science Theater was a thing, we'd do our own riffing on it and make fun of it and... You know, but now I go back and I think about it and I'm thinking, you know, you've got movies like The Mm -hmm. Hunger Games, Mm -hmm. which, you know, sure, we don't have a lot, but we can make you compete for it or we can use it as entertainment to keep people occupied while we're doing all this other stuff. So I think um, it's sort of like an interesting commentary. If you take away the repeated chase scenes. That happens when they're they're doing the so called game, the Running Man game. Uh, it's the same thing over and over and over. But well, you know the thing is that uh, you know Arnold um, really thought that it was a terrible decision uh, that the director filmed it as a uh, as a um, game show, mm-hmm. and instead of because you know it it, it kind of lost the uh, deeper themes of that the the show was projecting. Yeah, so, so losing our humanity, it yeah. seems like. You know. So he was not thrilled to death that it was filmed the way it was filmed, but it's still... And we got the, we got what they were trying to say, it, I think. It, it, it came still, across. It's still a classic in, in the sense, a cult classic. I don't remember Dweezil Zappa or Mick Fleetwood at all. I'm sure once you would see it again, it would be like, oh, okay, there they are. I saw yeah. I saw a still. Well, it even had... Uh, um, I believe there's uh, the former governor is of, uh, oh, no, why can't I think of his name? Why do I get these things 
Swiss cheese to my brain. I'm like Sam Oh, Ventura? Beckley. Yes, he was in it. Two former governors yeah, now. Yes, exactly. Two bodybuilders, two former yeah, governors. Yeah, exactly. Who would have predicted that in the 80s, mm-hmm. you know? So. so. And then there were some movies that I liked. Just, I just loved them back in the day. And, but now I'm like, eh, you know. Like, for instance, I loved the movie Inner Space when it came out. And then mm-hmm. a few years after. But now... Some time has gone by. I'm like, I saw it enough. I don't have to ever see it again. So, another Dennis Quaid movie. Yeah, and and so I gave up counting probably after the eighth time that mm. I had seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. But I was a teenager at the time, so yeah, that really did appeal to me. I was goofy and I was stupid, and I didn't know any better. And you know, I'll that I'll always have a place fond memories of Bill and Ted. But would I watch it again? Probably not. But the first sci-fi movie that ever truly bothered me that I saw that I can remember is the remake of The Blob. Oh, yeah. The remake did disturb me as well. I could watch it now, and it wouldn't bother me. But No, I think I've had enough of that movie. And, uh, yeah, I think the one... You wouldn't watch it with me? I think the one part that gets me is it's one of the teenage boys. Uh, they're at some place like a police station or whatever, and he gets attacked by the blob because he didn't know the blob was behind him. And then this particular blob is more transparent, so you mm-hmm. kind of see what's in it. Uh, what's in it, and his is like the body is breaking down, and it just, ew, it just that's disturbing. Uh, yeah, it's disturbing for me because the original blob, you know, you got the blob. They didn't really show much of beyond that. You know, you're there for one minute, and then all of a sudden you're gone. And there's actually been there were three blob movies you had the original Original. there was one it was done in the 70s that not many people know of oh really yeah and then in the the the, that one that we're we're speaking of but it as far as i mean it's a it's another decent movie uh typical 80s at that time um i just prefer not to revisit it and does does the blob (laughs) does it not get bigger every time it every time it ingests uh some more food it gets bigger and bigger yes. so it could just pretty much eat the world i guess at some point it could but uh i mean it's not eating plant life or anything like that i guess it has to eat like people and animals and, and you know reminds me of that black and white movie i cannot think of the name of it but you told me about it i said i have this it's a mystery science theater thing it's this space alien that comes oh, down uh, and it just eats people uh, by t- uh, creatures something terror uh, ter- uh, yeah i can't think of the name mm-hmm. of it but basically it sort of ambles slowly and awkwardly up to people that are making out and You're right there and just sort of um waits for them to sort of <laughs> put themselves in its mouth exactly <laughs> so it can like pull them in through the mouth into the back something terror Man, it's I, a walking I, carpet or something, you know. That, so that, that bugs me there. You know, the creeping terror. The creeping terror. Because it yes. literally creeped. You could have run away from this thing easily. Black and white, uh, you know. And it's funny because when we were first, I guess, getting you know to know each other, and I told you that uh, there were many movies that I'd seen. You were talking about Mystery Science Theater, and I had seen a lot of these movies unmisty because i would i would make fun of them and they're just cheesy so anyway we're actually going next week to riff tracks live to see uh, carnival Carnival of of souls Souls. yeah um now back in the day when when we had cable and this is not you know before i met you and whatnot we had the disney channel so i got to see flight of the navigator over and over and over and over Mm -hmm. and i really liked it but it's really dated now because it's the 80s but he was from the 70s but it was a cute little family movie, but all the references in it now are very, very dated. And the only thing I can tell you about it is the boy who played the lead, Joe Kramer, has just been charged with bank robbery in Canada. Mm-hmm. So no happy endings there. That's sad. But here's something I know you can talk about. Original RoboCop Dance Till You Drop. Robocop dance to you drop you don't you never heard the song that came out they played it on top uh, I think I vaguely, radio I think you played it once for me and but beyond that but the movie itself is a classic I wonder it, if it's on Spotify it, uh, it, you probably could check that out 
But uh, RoboCop. I like original RoboCop. Mm-hmm. It's um, the remake couldn't come anywhere close to it. Once again, we're talking about uh, you know the idea of Detroit falling in disrepair and crime and violence and. W- and wait. what do they do? They put up a statue wait, wait, of it. Hold on, wait a minute. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was reading the news here. Um, but yeah, the reality is, it's amazing how some of these movies uh, kind of mirror what has actually happened. I mean, I, sure, who wouldn't want RoboCop now? We're talking about the original. Mm-hmm. The uh, updated one, that's another story altogether. Mm. I liked it. It wasn't too bad. But anyway, the original RoboCop, what, uh, uh, was it Peter Weller? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. And, uh, he gets around in sci-fi. Yeah, he does. And uh, it's a great, uh, uh, I guess what you would call an American cyberpunk um, is what Maybe. that is that theme as far as you've got uh, um, electronic and and anyway so but yeah RoboCop very cool well he the was it Ver, Paul Verhoeven was the director maybe mm-hmm. uh, he says he, he made some very obvious allusions to uh, RoboCop as being a savior figure he even has him walking through water to yeah, walking on, get that yeah. illusion across right. and there's something about it even though they didn't have the practical effects the, or CGI that was really, you know, it was like stop motion or something for yeah, yeah, stop those robotic for things the they Ed, made. The Ed, um, the Ed, I can't think of the yeah. number or sequence, but the the big ones, yes. But I like the movie, but I still like the song better. I can't believe you don't remember that RoboCop sure dance I'll, to drop. I'll, I'll and they had snippets from the movie. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Uh, the, I don't know what it was about RoboCop. It was just everything you could want at the time. Right. But Very cheesy. Guns. What did you like about the remake, though? I can't. It was so tepid. Uh, you know what it is, is that I don't want to come across as, uh, you know, when a, when they remake a movie, um, and this movie was, uh, the, the updated version was kind of remade. They borrowed elements of the original movie. But they they left out the cheese factor, I guess, in it to kind of give it. Uh, uh, I don't want to give it. Uh, well, give they it. Did, more. He always knew who he was. They right. never had to like wipe his m- mind and right. stop. Um, I just thought you know it had, it had some good actors in it. Um, yeah, that was the only redeeming quality is it had um, Jennifer Ely who played the quintessential Lizzie Bennet in the Colin Firth version of Pride and Prejudice. And there we go. Boom. We, we've Drop got, the mic. We got your pride and prejudice in for the night. Yeah. So and I'm just going to, the more you hate it, the more I'm going to keep mentioning the, it. The thing is that um, the original um, is great. and But I, like I said, you know, I was getting to make a point about these updated movies. Uh, it's like I can complain about them remaking another movie, um, i.e. Ghostbusters. And... You know, but at the same time, they brought something different. Uh, they had an opportunity to make another Ghostbusters, but you know they didn't. And the you know with the, all the original cast. But getting back to the the RoboCop is they you know uh, we're talking about uh, a whole new generation that hasn't experienced what we experienced, and it's just interesting to see what the newer generation has. And I say newer generation, I'm talking about the millennials, mm-hmm. uh, what they have to offer their take on the story. So, you know, I get a, I get a new movie out of it. Uh, it may not be, uh, you know, uh, the, what the original was like per Batum, but you know, it is what it is. So I'm just, I'm reaching that age where it's like, Hey, cool. You're, you're listening or you're watching RoboCop. Cool. Yeah. It's your version. Uh, hey, I can respect well, that. Well, another one that is sort of a classic now from the A's that is might be about to be remade. I'm not sure. I couldn't mm-hmm. verify it. Was Starman? Starman? Yeah. It's a good movie, but it was sad. Jeff, you know, uh, Jeff, Jeff Bridges. Bridges yes, yeah. and um, Mira. Um, what was her name? Was it Karen Black? Was it? No, it wasn't. No. Ka- oh, no, Karen Black. That's a whole different story. Yeah, I don't know why I'm thinking about her. Yeah. Um, wow, I'm old. <laughs> but um, yeah, it'll come to me later. But yeah. that movie is definitely a good movie. It's 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 a well written sci fi uh, piece of uh, story that mm-hmm. uh, has a sad ending, like you say. Um, but um, overall, that movie I've heard is could be possibly remade. Now, also. 
there was a TV show, Short Lived, um, that had... That, yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah, but we had that guy from Wings, uh, Robert, and he... Uh, let me change it so you'll understand. Remember Airplane. For, airplane. Uh, Robert... Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so... Um, and and I apologize to the space cadets, but you should know me by now. Sometimes... As long I'm, as you didn't say Gene Hackman, we're uh, doing good. Yes, yeah, so as, uh, just stay away from the Gene Hackman thing, and we're awesome. So, but yeah, he's he was in this short-lived TV show based upon that movie. But uh, yeah, I'd like to see a, a, a modern, uh, updated version of Starman, and I think uh, they could do it. It would play pretty well. I think so. They would have to just. Um, I think they could. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. The the original just seemed more innocent, you know, and. Mm-hmm. I just feel like we're so jaded they'll find a way to screw that up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Also, I have some uh, things I can just mention real quick, like The Thing, the 82 version. Did you get that thing? Did you get that thing? Yes. That was uh, flipping weird. And I had never seen the movie all the way to the end until within the last few years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like how there's been some modern takes on the ending of uh, who was an alien left uh, yeah. alive. And, uh, See, that's intriguing. <laughs> it's like, who's the alien now? You don't know who trusts trust. And... Well, I guess... Um... But that goes back to Star Trek again on Deep Space Nine where you had the shapeshifters that were infiltrating easily because they could easily shapeshift. Well, but the difference in between those, uh, well, yeah, the... Uh, they yeah. did have to regenerate, though. Right, uh, but... Uh, they didn't have downtime. So that was kind of like this, yeah, and uh, uh, Kurt Russell's character at the very end, they say that uh, uh, the bottle of whiskey that he has is not necessarily a bottle of whiskey, but it's a Molotov cocktail um, that he gives the other guy, uh, like, take a swig at it. And and the other guy drinks it, so it kind of makes you believe that the other guy is is actually an alien mm-hmm. that's left, and so and that's where it ends. But you know, I hate to go back to the fu- future from that point. Is that they did a prequel to this? Is that the one where they ended up on the ship, uh, the yes. alien ship? Okay, yeah, that's where I've seen that. From. Because where the show starts off, it immediately starts off where the dogs are running and the Norwegians are trying to kill the dogs because they know they're, they're infected. And, and of course, uh, they end up, and then that's where the beginning of the original movie starts. Well, the prequel takes place before that, and it leads up to the dogs running off at the very end of that movie. So Interesting. It's definitely, uh, if you could see the prequel to this, you'll love watching that and then revisiting uh, The Thing later. Now, you know, it's The Thing is actually based upon um, the 1950s yes. movie, which I think is fascinating because I remember talking to my grandmother about this movie, and she said that, uh, you know, back then in the 50s, they'd do all these gimmicky things with movies. And, and the particular thing with this movie is that any time the thing came on the, the uh, screen, they lit up the theater in a green light. <laughs> and and so you That's knew cool. that the thing was there, and you know, it wish kinda, they do stuff like that today. Yeah, um, so that was kind of fascinating. It's kind of like when we went to That's the better Star, than 3D to the me. The Star Trek experience mm-hmm. when I got probed. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that <laughs> <laughs> never forget it. Yeah, you, well, you you'll never forget it. But anyway, so yeah, she reminded me, uh, or she told the story about how going to see that movie. And the theater lighting up in green every time the thing came out. And, of course, the thing in that particular one looked like a Frankenstein alien monster versus in the thing. Shape-shifting. That, yeah, the, compared to the shape-shifting where you didn't know who the thing was. That's the more scary than <clears> the <throat> not the, knowing. The, the unknown. And, and, you know, it could be anyone. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so that's my take on that. Yeah. All right, and some other other honorable mentions: Time Bandits, because mm-hmm. it was quirky, like like a Monty Python episode. Yeah, and one of my favorite lines ever comes from that end of that movie: "Don't touch it; it's evil." <laughs> um, I guess would you call Jurassic Park sci-fi? Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, well, I've heard something about a, they recently bred it or created an embryo that has a ter- Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, I don't know if that's factual or not, but I kind of, you know, kind of want to cross that. But why? Just to prove they can. One, you're dealing with uh, sci-fi, which means it's not scientific. 
It's not sci. I mean, I guess the confusion is sci-fi. We automatically think Space. spaceship and pew 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 lasers and all that <laughs> stuff, but science fiction is you know uh, Blade Runner, prime example, science fiction. Um, uh, you know, science. You know, it's it's science. It could. It's. I guess science fiction makes us believe that it could be based in science fact. Why? Why is it when you say Blade Runner, I keep thinking Minority Report? Is that weird? No, I, I guess there's there's kind of some things that are kind of looking like that. Uh, both on the other thing. Now you reminded me of Patrick Sporer in a way, um, <laughs> because uh, you know the precogs. But um, yeah, so yeah, I guess you I, could I think Patrick's way cooler than the oh, ones in yeah, that yeah. movie. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, people keep mentioning They Live. I didn't really have anything to say about it because I never saw it, but I know about the movie. I've I've seen clips. I came here to chew bubble gum in the kick ass, and I'm all out of bubble gum. So, yeah, They Live is... is I can only hear moss in my head when you say that. (laughs) It's a great movie. Um, I guess when you finally see the aliens uh, in this movie, uh, they're kind of freaky looking and... um, yeah, Roddy Rod Piper is in this movie, and uh, probably Roddy Roddy. Yeah, Roddy Rod. <coughs> Sorry, a little dry there. So, where did the glasses come from? Well, the glasses. The uh, they, they, I guess they find these. Uh, he he finds this box and has all these sunglasses in, and he takes one, puts it on, and all of a sudden he's able to see the truth. You know, the advertisements that say obey and uh, do all this and. Um, you know, trying to keep, uh, I guess, the the public under submission without knowing, sub, you know, so subliminally. Yeah. <laughs> so, once again, a little dry there. So, but it, overall, it's definitely one of a classic sci-fi that uh, if you are looking for something to watch, you should definitely check it out. I probably need to go back and look mm-hmm. at that. Um, yeah. Another one I've never seen but gets talked about a lot and praised <laughs> is brazil yeah that movie's kind of quirky um uh, i'm trying to terry gilliam uh, yeah uh, uh, same guy did 12 monkeys mm, 12 monkeys but that was uh, a 90s thing uh, it? yeah uh, kind of an updated um uh, i guess it stars jonathan price i think mm-hmm. there's a scene there with robert de niro um he's, he's yeah, cheating uh, Mike, just so you know he's cheating So anyway, um, providing the information to the audience, why don't you tell me everything about this movie? No, go ahead. No, I insist. I've never seen it. Oh, well, then thank you. I wish you could see the look on his face right now. I'm going to be, there's going to be a strong worded critique after the show. Um, that's what, But it's on my list to go back and look at. And another one that is probably somewhat controversial but i can't help it i like the movie and i don't like it because it's associated with 2001 a space odyssey i like it on its own which is 2010 Mm -hmm. which is of course you know kubrick denies ever you know that that's a part of official canon or anything because you know kubrick went so far as to destroy the sets and everything from 2001 so nobody would do this but they still went ahead and did 2010. Well, before you go any further, let's go ahead and top, take our top of the hour break. And when we come back, we'll talk more sci fi 80s.
You are listening to Space Boy Universe. Now here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. So when we last left, um, Sir Lana was talking about um, 2010. Co- uh, 2010 and Kubrick and destroying all the sets and because mm-hmm. he didn't want to uh, uh, anybody to come get it and make a sequel or anything. They still that. did. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, I'm reminded by uh, Adam Savage uh, how he has, his, you know, he, he's able to replicate everything. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy for them to just look at things and, you know, kind of pencil it out and figure it all out and rebuild stuff. Well, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a sequel because, you know, Kubrick's movies, especially Mm -hmm. 2001, was like nothing probably had ever been done before. It had a feel and a tone. I don't know how you could replicate it. You'd have to be inside that man's mind, I would think, Mm -hmm. to get that again. So 2010 was more of a commentary on the Cold War, I think, between us and the Soviet Union and how we had to overcome our government's petty bickering to work together to get something accomplished millions of miles away or however many miles away it is. I don't even know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know what it was about that movie. I liked it for on its own. It didn't have to be associated with the first one to really make me like it. But, you know, you Hal's back and they booted him up and, mm-hmm. and- trying to find out what happened and... <clears throat> and the gentleman that played David Bowman um, mm-hmm. came back and still looked great for that time. And mm-hmm. yes, uh, Cortana said Interstellar came very close. Oh, that movie! That movie rocks. Yeah, that is a great movie. I guess Cortana. it went over my head. Um, but yeah, that movie—it's a good movie. Now, there's one I was going to mention here. Let's see. I think I accidentally typed over it. Yep. Here's a movie, I Wish This Technology Was Real. Mm -hmm. And it's another Dennis Quaid film. (laughs) All righty then. And it had Max von Sydow. Okay. He's a big name. Oh, okay. I had to think about where we're going in this direction. Yes. So, it is Dreamscape. That was a pretty dang awesome movie. That's another one of those movies I remember um, walking down a mile to the theater and I got there early for the f- first showing, and I stayed there until I saw it three times in one day. Really? <clears throat> yes, that was one That's of That's crazy. Yeah, because, well, I figured, uh, well, I have nothing other to do. It's summer break. <clears throat> I might as well just stay in the theater all day and then go home. And, uh, yeah, so I saw it three times in the, th- the theater, and it was it was enjoyable. So. Yeah, um, that's <clears throat> one of those. VHS rentals mm-hmm. that I saw over and over again. That and early cable. cable early yeah. cable. And I wish that technology was real and that you and I had it so you well, could come into my dreams and make everything just stop doing that, you know, just mm-hmm. stop being weird and, you know, straighten everything out so I can have pleasant dreams. So, because um, he could he could get in a chair and mm-hmm. jump into other, other people's, people's dreams. Yes. And help them out if they're having night terrors. And of course, and as we see through this movie, we have a guy that was mentally not stable. and He was sort of like a dream terrorist in a way. Exactly. And, um, yeah, so they ultimately, they had to jump into the president's Apocalyptic. Dream. Yeah, it was a Nuclear war dream. dream. Yeah, and so they, uh, it's quite interesting. And that's another one on anybody's radar should definitely watch that movie. Yeah, I, I I liked it, and that's the one I can go back and still enjoy, and it's not too 80s cheesy for me. It turns mm-hmm. me off. Now, there's one more, and I can't tell you much about it because I haven't seen it since the time period it came out, mm-hmm. and I can't go back and watch it. No one can. You had to have lived through the time when it came out, and that is Electric Dreams. That is definitely a very favorite movie of mine and uh, uh, what do you have to elaborate well, on? Well, the only computer, it's this guy, I don't know if was he a computer program or something, his computer becomes sentient well, and it becomes hap- a little obsessed. What happens is that basically he ends up buying a computer and in the process, uh, he, I guess he's you know doing, you know, back then it was like kind of rare to have to do a lot of things we take for granted, like email and, you know, programming. And, this was and, so back in the day. Yeah, yeah, definitely back, back in the day. 
And so, <clears throat> uh, so he gets this computer, and what happens is he's, I guess, opening a bottle of champagne, and he, he spills it all over this computer. And, and the, instead of frying it and killing yeah, it like it, it like should it have. It should have. Um, it, it makes the computer become sentient. And, uh, they probably didn't know much about how computers <clears throat> work, did they? Mm-hmm. And in the process, uh, I guess this guy, uh, Miles, um, uh, has, a, I guess, a neighbor that is across from him in his mm-hmm. apartment. Uh, That's what I remember. And they start dating, and he you know, is attracted to her, and uh, uh, they kind of head it up. And, of course, the computer gets jealous and uh, causes all kind of havoc and, and everything. And it's really it's – kind of, it's this is one of those cheesy – Good movies. I'd love to see it again, but it has something about it's tied up with, I don't know if it's copyrights or what, but there's mm-hmm. no release of it anywhere. Yeah, they, I mean, you, you're it's not, not gonna, on VHS, <clears throat> it's not on DVD, it's, it's you not, can't buy it for digital, it just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it, uh, the female was Virginia Madison, of all people, in this movie. Mm. And, um, you know, she was, well, very attractive back then, and so... Um, it had a great theme song too. It, yes, it had. we'll always be together, together in electric dreams. Now, the wonderful thing about this soundtrack is it's produced by two famous artists. One of which is one of my favorite all-time artists, and you definitely hear it in the Space Boy universe or Space Boy music uh, that I produce, and that's Giorgio Marauder. Oh, Marauder. 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 Or, yeah, which he he did one song with a guy who's the lead singer of the Human League. Mm-hmm. That's Electric Dreams, and it also has Jeff Lynne doing music in from his, ELO. In, in, ELO, which is not the first movie he's done music for movies. In fact, when we were talking about cheesy movies earlier about Xanadu, Jeff Lynne uh, of ELO wrote music for that movie as well. Yeah, yeah, he sure did. Don't walk away. So this, I mean, right off the bat, you would think, oh, wow, this has got some great music to go with it. And uh, um, I like it. I mean, the movie, I can't watch it as a movie. I watch it more of, as a, 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 a music video. Uh, it also has Boy George in it, uh, as far as music is concerned. You can only watch it in your mind. Yeah, so, but yeah. <laughs> well. Somebody should, you know, go back and do a remake mm-hmm. of it in that time period so we have it again, you know. Well, it'd be an interesting take now that we have the internet and mm-hmm. how the computer becoming... San- uh, uh, no, it's, it, no, it wouldn't. It's not possible because we have VR now. Well, and, I mean, virtual reality the coming to life and... I already know. done it on Star Trek. <clears throat> anyway, so, but yeah, great movie. Uh, I want to talk about briefly Alien Nation, the movie, okay, which did spawn Alien Nation, the TV series, which was nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, but Alien Nation, you have this race of aliens that crash land on Earth, mm-hmm. and they were set up to where they had overseers and slave work, slave two, labor, kind pretty of like much two, two classes, two of, classes. But they, I mean, you know, they all looked the same. They just had some kind of like identifying marks or tattoos on their wrists or something right. which they could cover up um it did spawn a tv series and i enjoyed both i enjoyed the tv series which you know completely different people were in both of those it was just like how do you integrate ex- inter- extraterrestrial beings into the into society of los angeles although I, I don't see how anybody would notice in that city but uh really fascinating concept you know, as they're trying to integrate and get them, you know, to be citizens, and they're trying to learn our culture, we're trying to learn theirs. My favorite thing about that is the aliens in Alien Nation get drunk off of um, sour milk. Mm-hmm. You know, that's so weird. Right. So I'm like, wow, their houses must smell great. And I love the <laughs> fact that the, this uh, drug that turns them weird it look like detergent. Um, in fact, I and think their blood looked like Pepto Bismol, and that they couldn't be in salt water. Yeah, they couldn't be around it salt was like water. Acid to them. So why do they want to go live on beachfront uh, properties? You know. Yeah. So go figure. Yeah. Uh, great movie. Uh, the movie had James Caan in it. Um, mm-hmm. Also, Mandy uh, Patinkin uh, was, uh, I guess, the alien. Yeah, yeah, assi- he was assigned to him. Um, so yeah, the that, and then of course the TV series. Um, the character played Sykes was a Vulcan in Enterprise. There you go. He went on to play a very logical Vulcan. Mm-hmm. And the 
woman who played George Francisco's wife was in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. So there are Star Trek crossovers all get, throughout there. They, they get around. They get around. And hey, just to let everybody know, if you want to call in, the number is 713-701-5214. That's 713 What happened there? I just like, okay, what am I thinking? 713-701-5214. That is the number to call in if you... Want to talk about your favorite sci-fi 80s movie or just a, a shout-out? Because I know we hello. skipped a bunch that y'all were mentioning. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, it's a big universe, but this is what uh, the show does. It opens your mind to other possibilities and, and gets you to think, hey, I remember that movie, or hey, there's this other movie I haven't seen in a while that I need to check out. So saying that, so the phone line is open. Um, yeah. What do you got next? Or Only thing, um, two more I want to mention was my stepmother is an alien. I think that's a cute movie. Dan, I really Dan, like that. Dan Aykroyd. Because mm-hmm. um, he believes in them. Right. And uh, Kim Bessinger. Yes. Swing. Yeah. I really thought that was a cute <laughs> movie. And uh, too young, uh, Seth Green and that other girl, I can't think of her name. She went on to be in like Buffy, American Pie, and in that one show oh, you yeah. watched. I, I, Allison I, Hannigan? I believe so, yeah. yes. Uh, I, she's cute. I they like were her. little, little kids, right. you know. So, that is a cute movie. It seemed like there was a big chunk of that movie missing for exposition purposes, but Mm -hmm. I don't suppose it matters. It was just fun. And and I'm trying to think, uh, uh, who else was in it? Uh, The other comedian from Saturday Night Live. uh, I'm an actor. That's it. Oh, John Lovitz. Yes, He was the brother. How can I forget that? He was the brother. He ends up going with the aliens at the end of the movie. and uh, and, uh, He's great. Yeah, so that was great, too, as well. He was funny in The Wedding Singer. Mm-hmm. You know, he's all creepy behind the stage. Right. But um, the only thing I got to mention is Communion and how I never saw it because the book cover was like, nope, 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 going to watch that. <laughs> so, um, but I did see Fire in the Sky whenever that came out. I don't recall when that came out. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, I guess, uh, yeah. That freaked me out. Not that might have been late uh, late eighties, early nineties, possibly Fire in the Sky, and of course that's uh, more of uh, based on uh, an an actual event that happened. Um, so I can't remember exactly. Um, did you learn anything from that other than you just know. don't go out in the woods at night or get out of the truck? Yeah, alone. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, last thing you want to do in the truck. is stay in the truck. And just keep driving. So, um, some other honorable mentions, Mad Max 2, which I don't recall seeing any of them. Um, Flash Gordon. Mm-hmm. Of course, we talked oh, about. Th- yeah, the, the significant one about Flash Gordon is um, uh, the music was done by Queen. Um, yes. And that awesome. is that is one, another one of those movies that... Uh, that you really get the feel that it it has the the 1930s 40s flash gordon feel to it and look to it yeah and but uh kind of light slightly updated for the 80s um but the music was phenomenal and it's a classic i think that you should definitely check out and another one they that gets some praise and i don't know why it just passes me by was the 80s version of the fly mm. it's probably because i've always thought jeff goldblum was weird looking to look at anyway on his own he's well, much better now um now that he's aged a little bit yeah <laughs> I, I can handle him now but he was kind of he was supposed to be a sex symbol i suppose but he mm. just I, I would see him and I'd be like ew I, I bet he smells like old <laughs> socks or something you know <laughs> i don't want anything to do with him uh, i love the fact that uh uh Let's see. Uh, um, this probably smells like Paco Rabanne. When they, when they merged, uh, anybody that's uh, a fan of Rick and Morty, um, Cronenberg. David Cronenberg. Yeah, yeah, David Cronenberg. They referred to him in in the sense that when everybody gets mashed up with different things, uh, they Cronenberg. They Cronenberg it up. <laughs> yeah, they Cronenberg it up. Yeah, that movie was... Um, I did see this, The Fly, mm-hmm. way back when, and I just... It gets a lot of praise for um, the special effects Mm -hmm. and some other things. They said it was one of his best performances. Yeah. 
And they, that's where you get the line, be afraid, be very afraid. Gina Davis is in that Of one. a naked Jeff Goldblum, I would be. <laughs> Another movie that gets talked about a lot and praised as a cult classic, and I keep saying I'm going to see it, is The Reanimator. Yes, that's a definitely Jeff. I mean, and what gets me is that Combs is, you know, you like Combs. Uh, and he's, he's been, the versatile Star Trek character. He's it, like in every flipping Star Trek except the original. Now, the uh, reanimator is, uh, uh, it's kind of, what is it, like an H.P. Lovecraft's classic tale of horror? I don't know that it's Lovecraft, but I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I've read a lot of Lovecraft, but certainly not every single mm-hmm. novel and story. I mean, even Roger Ebert gave the film three out of four stars, and uh, he he said that uh, I walked out somewhat surprised and revigorated. Uh, so, of all people, going into mm-hmm. a movie, I mean, the movie is quite interesting, and it is a cult. It definitely ranks in there as. Uh, probably, I would say, the top 50 cult films. It that, took that a first prize at the Paris Festival of Fantasy, Science mm-hmm. Fiction and Horror, a prize at the Cannes mm-hmm. Film Festival, and it said they had a short-lived series of comic books based on it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that tells, tells me I don't know everything. But, uh, yeah, th- if you like Jeffrey Combs, then this movie you're going to definitely like because he's in it, but... It's just, it's on that vein of some kind of zombie. When I say zombie, I do I say that very loosely, but he he has the ability to reanimate reanimate the dead. Yes. So, but yeah, definitely check that movie out. It was great. I'm going to because I want to see one if there really is a Lovecraft connection or not, and mm-hmm. I know it's about a guy who gets a professor's head he's a student he gets a professor's head and reanimates it and i don't know what well, wacky the, things ensue from there the professor was a major jer- jerkosaurus and so i hate ah. to say that he had it coming but he had it coming now they talk about in a list of sci-fi films legend but that's a fantasy film i don't see it as a sci-fi film no, i would still call that a sci-fi film but i didn't realize it was a ridley scott film what the reanimator no legend oh okay yeah you threw me off there legend. Now, yeah that is a uh, fantasy sci-fi kind of probably the best role tim curry's ever been in in my opinion <laughs> uh another one i'd like to see is scanners i never saw scanners mm-hmm. uh, that's uh, if, uh i guess everybody has seen uh, a small clip of that where it shows a guy's head exploding um, that's where that's from mm-hmm. i see it all the time in uh you know mashups and memes memes and yes gifts with sound on there's a lot of things i watch on youtube nobody understands <laughs> even those exist um i never saw the original mad max either so that's uh, uh classic as well yeah there's there's a lot more dino you're right but if it wasn't in the 80s we ain't talking about it so <laughs> um but if you want to call in and give me a good what for, 713-701-5214, because I'm officially out of content. Really? You went through all that? I'm mm-hmm. trying to think of something else that you Yeah, might we left miss. out the big ones. We left out Trek. We left out Star Wars because we've covered them. We left out Back to the Future and Alien and Ghostbusters because those have all been kind of covered mm-hmm. in the previous shows. So we didn't feel like going over it all again. So there's a lot of... Um, alien type based movies that i need to go back like they live and there's one that i'm trying to find it's called the society the society why is it's that an sound? 80s thing that sounds very familiar yeah it's very strange to look at i've seen clips of it on youtube so i don't know where i would find it now to would, watch it um now is that particular movie in the 80s i want to say it is had a very 80s feel about it too looking at it something about this guy's parents are not quite right and uh and his sister too um i think i remember the cover of the movie now it has some chick and she's pulling her face off yeah um bizarre it is bizarre all right right <laughs> oh remember we were talking about that movie millennium yes Millennium is definitely 
Now, see, I don't know if that's, is that late 80s or early It had 90s? to be because I remember going to the dollar video rental with, with Holly and Chris getting it. Chris Christopherson is the main lead in that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, do you want to elaborate? Uh, That's all I remember. Something about a plane that could fly through time, like well, a, a jet, commercial it, it, jet liner or something. It wasn't about the jet flying through time. It was about, well, it was in it was in the far future where I guess the future was in this dismal ending situation. And um, they were trying to fix time and or to, to, to grab people from the past from... Known plane crashes, what they would do is they knew the history showed that this plane would crash. And so what they did was they brought the plane kind of forward, took all the people that were alive uh, off the plane and put people back on, you know, these body double things, you know, dead bodies back onto the plane, sent it to the past. And then, you know, those people would die. But then they would take all the people they took off the plane and send it further, send them further into the future to like, Sounds you know, complicated. it does sound complicated. It's time, you know, what can you do? Um, and then, and of course, Chris Christopherson's character was a boy on one of these planes where uh, he sees this woman that eventually he falls in love with because he starts as he as an older person. Um, he meets up with her again. And uh um, but yeah, so yeah, that's another one of those movies is a pretty awesome movie and time travel involved in. I'd have to watch it again because I don't remember any of that. I'll remember something about a plane. <laughs> yeah, there's, well, there's definitely a plane involved and there's some kind of robot three CPO guy in the really? future. Yeah, it's, it's, that is kind of funny and. Um, but yeah, so that's involved in all that stuff. And I'm sorry that I didn't talk about Dune, but. I've only ever seen clips of it. I've never sat down and watched the whole movie. Um, I get that confused with Tremors because oh, <laughs> of the worm thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I I really can't make a commentary on it other than there was an official coloring book for the movie Dune. Hmm. And I'd like to have it just because that sounds weird. So on that, Mark, uh, Solana, we're at the bottom of the hour. Really? Yeah, these things fly by quick. So let's play our last bit of music here, and then we'll get down to the nitty-gritty of the last 30 minutes of the show. And hopefully somebody might call in just to say howdy.
you are listening to Space Boy Universe. Now here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. We're back, and believe it or not, I think Sir Lana has somebody on the phone. Yes. Please self-identify. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, James Cruz. I finished up watching Red vs. Blue, so I figured I'd call you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so how are, how, are you, how are you tonight, sir? Uh, just hanging out, uh, listening to the show. Figured I'd give you a call. Well, that's great. Say hi to the universe. Well, the universe thanks you for calling tonight. Do you have a favorite <laughs> 1980s sci-fi movie? Oh, man. Uh, favorite. I mean, I, uh, you still got to go with uh, probably like Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Those are I mean, it's cla- classic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's got and you the... Still, uh, still watch it every time it's on. Uh, what's it, Robert Zemeckis? He has the rights to that, and he made sure it goes down to his children and their grandchildren, so nobody can try to remake it. Because that would be a travesty, I think. I, I, do honestly, James? Do you think that they could make a remake out of that movie? No way. No, it'd have to be completely different. But in that, like, maybe Marty's grandkids accidentally find, you know, some kind of time travel thing and find out all the adventures he had, or. Mm-hmm. Netflix would have to make a, a series yes. out of it or something because, like, you know how I was saying earlier about, like, how um, Stranger Things is, mm-hmm. like, all these movies wrapped up in the one thing, and that's why I think we all, like, adore it so much, you know? It, was, it takes you back, you know, and that's what, if they did something like a Back to the Future, yeah, whatever, make a flying uh, something else and... <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, have a have a have that same type of premise. It'd be pretty cool, yeah, and they could get they could have multiple series of, on Netflix with all that stuff. You know, like it, more than a hoverboard and in a in an episode with a train. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, sorry, Kay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were pointing out that the reason Stranger Things was so good is because it was built upon the Goonies and Stand by Me mm-hmm. and some of the things that we loved. Uh, from the eighties yeah. and other sci-fi, you know, it picked it picked in different you know places. from different e. things. E. You know, definitely, e. you feel the Spielberg feel in this uh, particular mo- uh, series. Um, I loved it. You know, I, I often he even made the kid actors watch some of those before they started shooting the, mm-hmm. the series, so they could. Understand. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> the two brothers. Another factoid about you know, since we're talking about Strange Things, is that they Stranger had already uh, with Stranger Things, yes. As they already, I always say strange too. <laughs> yeah, so it, they've greenlit the second series uh, before they even release finish the first yeah, one. Yeah, the, the first one. So uh, they, they had some good uh, vibes going into this particular series. So it'll be interesting to see. There'll be a comes couple next. new characters, yeah. and some of them will go away, and I don't know if they'll come Unfortunately, back. Unfortunately, Barb is not is coming gone back. Gone for good. Yes. She's dead as a doornail. Yeah, the um, the guy that plays the cop. Um, I, I live in Cleveland it, up here, and he was on a like a, a show that uh, like a, a talk show, like a sports talk show. One morning, mm-hmm. they interview like tons of stuff. It's a pretty cool show. But uh, anyway, they had him on, and, and they just like randomly called him because like they, they were all fixated on the show. And that dude was awesome. He's like that guy in real life. <laughs> like, like I don't know. He he's said it was probably his favorite role he's ever I mean I, I guess every actor would say any role is their favorite but like just because it was like I just played myself <laughs> like basically mm-hmm. and like he's a really cool dude and he really likes the show and, and uh, yeah he's all about the second season two coming up so mm-hmm. it, it's pretty cool yeah I'm a, I'm a big movie buff too so I like all, I, all that sci-fi stuff they got me in this whole realm of everything basically well you, you're <laughs> definitely tuning into the right program because we love yeah. talking about movies and mm-hmm. and stuff like that and of course you know if you've heard a few of the shows now uh james you know that uh, i keep i always talk about netflix i mean i just love netflix because it gives me a chance to uh catch up on programming or get uh, locked into shows and uh that uh i wouldn't have gotten into and so yeah so but I kind of give you even going for back, you know, I grew up going to watch different movies and all this. And there was a time I even worked for Blockbuster Video as a manager. And so as a manager, I had to watch 
practically everything. You had and, to. Yeah. <laughs> to be I had to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, to be effective, yeah. you know, because, you know, back then during that time when I was working at Blockbuster, uh, you know, people would come up to you and you say, hey, ha- what have you seen? What's good? You know, and you, you don't want to. You ever been see- like a movie critic or anything? You know how to, I, don't, I think you have to log in like so many hours or something like that. I can't remember. How I haven't started. done it. I, I kind of watch, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people that have done it, but uh, it has never been my thing. It's been more of, uh, you know, I've been hanging out with, you know, some guys or whatever and, and tell them, hey, sure. have you seen this movie? This is really good. Or I can usually tell when. Somebody is like their level of movie watching, depending on what movie they're recommending or what they're watching. And because I've really, I've really gone down the rabbit hole, so to speak, on different movies, and and uh, I don't get to watch movies as much as I used to as when I worked for Blockbuster. But I think I do pretty good now with Netflix. Mm-hmm. You do. I have more fun watching Netflix than the movies that. I mean, yeah, that some of the new movies that came out I like was. Uh, I like that new Star Trek movie. That was awesome. Yeah, we're we getting um, an, another call. Should I just well, push them off? Or well, uh, I don't want to interrupt uh, uh, James here because he's first time. Uh, that's cool, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just jump back on the chat. All okay. right, well, Thank James, you, James, thanks for calling in. Yeah, I will call again. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, caller. Are you there? Yeah, it's me, Sir Lana. Hey, hey, it's, it's me. It's, it's not Beth. <laughs> it's the uh, the not Beth. No, it's actual not Beth. Fan. It's Fran. Hello, it's Fran. Fan. My my super nerd um, <laughs> uh, person that I love so She's much. She's gonna school us and tell us what's what here. I bet. Well, you know, it, there's not a day that doesn't go by that I mention something Marvel related or DC related or. Um, just anything that's out in the nerd universe that uh, Fran doesn't like off my 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 wall on Facebook, so it's kind of like yeah. Well, and I also like all the stuff that Sir Lana posts. Well, definitely. I mean, I definitely oh. see that too as well. <laughs> Mine are I, I more guess, angsty than his, but <laughs> I, I guess uh, she. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So what's going anyway, on? T- talk to me, dear. Nineteen eighties films. Mm-hmm. Last. Starfighter. Yes. Yeah, we talked about it. We talked about that, and it's definitely... Okay, well, I might have missed it because mm-hmm. I got in late. Yeah. No, it's fine. That was an awesome movie. Mm-hmm. It was. We loved it. You want to tell us a little I bit of... I loved it. Tell us a little bit of your What did you like it? about yeah, it? Yeah, what did you like about it? Well, the fact that the kid starts out playing video games, and boom, there he goes. To live the dream. Yeah. Somebody comes and picks him up and, woo, <laughs> it changes big time for him. And I thought, oh, that would be so cool mm-hmm. to be in that situation and get picked up yeah, and kinda, go. I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of me now where, you know, I play like I'm a broadcaster and then all of a sudden somebody comes and boop picks me up and there we go. So Yeah, we're just <laughs> pretending to be cool. Yeah, we're just <laughs> pretending. But uh yeah that that movie is is definitely one of my favorites as a kid and of course it has the video game tie in and then it's it's, you know, an adventure that gets unraveled uh, before his, his eyes. There. Big adventure. Yeah, big adventure. Right. We were speculating on <laughs> how they would remake it and today. What I, what I really loved about it was uh, his mentor, the guy who came and got him. Mm-hmm. Preston. Robert Preston. Was yeah. from, uh, oh, crap, Music I can't man. think of the name of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Music Man. God, okay, okay. That was. I'm going to quiz it, you. Quiz that you. made me really grok into what was going on because <laughs> I had the old guy, mm-hmm. and I went, "Yes." Yeah, that was definitely a good movie. I liked yeah. it a lot. It, that was the same time period, like Enemy Mind came out, and there was a lot of just like this explosion of sci-fi movies that kind of went under the radar, even. Right. <clears throat> kind of. And that's the only one I remember from the 80s. Most of my memories of the uh, sci-fi movies were from the 90s mm-hmm. or even the uh, TV series. It was from the 90s. Mm-hmm. 
I actually was home. <laughs> Back in the 80s, I was working all the time, so I didn't get to see anything. Hmm. I worked at night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, so it, it, didn't get to watch TV. <clears throat> I kind of went through a stint and, of that, too. Hmm? I said I kind of got, did that, too. I worked at a overnight uh, at a, a convenience store and back when i was mm -hmm. you know definitely younger and uh but uh i didn't get to see much tv and because by the time i got off uh i, I was ready to just crash <laughs> this is my right. not watching tv period this is i watched more tv before i met space boy and uh now that we don't have cable and i have full we have full-time right. jobs and what and now this so I really, really don't see much TV because we have to pay for specific things well, we want to see. The thing is that we watch a lot of YouTube. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, there's a lot of definitely entertaining Obviously. stuff. Yeah. You guys <laughs> are big YouTube fans. Yes, we yeah, are. Yeah, I can be thoroughly entertained with stuff on YouTube, just all kind of stuff. Well, just to put it in perspective, right now, uh, Serlana has definitely gotten into this uh, lady called Dr. Pimple Popper. And it's kind of, you know, it can be kind of gross for hmm. the uh, People un are squeamish. Uh, uninitiated, initiate, initi initiated. No, but, just people who don't like that type of thing. But anyway, this doctor, she does, you know, pops pimples, but she also removes cysts. She, Mostly she Oh, does. oh, 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 I know who that is. Yes. I've actually watched a few of those. It's quite fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So, but yeah. Solana, you like that? Yeah, there's something about her in particular, though, that, and I've watched other. She's uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's others out there who I guess sort of copied her. They put their videos online, and there's one that's actually here in Houston. And I'm like, you so and so hack. You know, she yeah, makes everybody exactly. look really unprofessional, and because she's. She, it's more than right. just the the procedure. She's very caring and she has thorough, an attention to detail. And yeah, uh, she, when she's taking, you know, once she's done very, everything, very. yeah. But then I'll go and I'll watch uh, people doing special makeup effects, doing special effects on their own face. I'll go watch, you know, cake decorating, cake baking videos, which I'll never actually do. And then I'll turn around and watch fail videos of people falling off skateboards, getting hit in the crotch. Those are always <laughs> oh, entertaining. Yeah. Car Cat crashes, videos. Car just crashes. Car crashes. Russian <laughs> videos. We love the Russian car crashes. It's in, there's just endless, the endless instructional tutorials, people playing organ music, just everything. Yeah, that's all I need. Yes. An internet connection and YouTube. Mm -hmm. I need nothing YouTube, else. YouTube has everything. And you know, it's Anything funny. you want to find, you just put in a little search deal and boom, mm -hmm. there it is. <laughs> I think it's funny that uh, w uh, when you, I guess John Teeter, depending on how you fall onto that, uh, the time travel or that uh, came back in time and talked to Art Bell, but or not talked to Art Bell. Well, I guess he communicated with Do him. Do you teeter on the edge of believing uh, yeah, teeter? Yeah, the first one. The one thing. Yeah, the th first one yeah, the, I remember. Yeah, uh, he brought that up the fact. That was back in the 90s. Yes. And, and I was very intrigued. And then when John Teeter 2 came out, not too long ago. <laughs> it could I sound went, like a movie. <laughs> right? And then I didn't. I didn't listen the other night when he was on, but I will go back and do a re-listen. Well, the reason just to see what's going on. I bring up him is because he mentioned that in the future, from that point, that people would watch uh, YouTube. Uh, follow, you know, he kind of described it. But um, other than that, uh, you know, do you have anything else for us, uh, Fran? No, no, that's it. All just right. I All love right. you guys. We love you too, sweetie. Keep up uh, following us, and the universe will take care of you in the end too. Oh, universe always takes care <laughs> of everyone. <laughs> All right, Fran. Okay, Fran. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Good night. Okay. Wow. Bye. Good night. Too late, right at the end. No, no, yeah. no. We just I picked you up because I didn't want to drop the call. So, <laughs> so go ahead. Well, Tyler. I was supposed to call you guys like two hours ago, but I was at the Freddy Krueger screening at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and there was no reception whatsoever. Oh, we understand completely. We knew you were at an event. We would figure we'll get you when we get you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So How's the show going? Is it still going? It's, well, still, it's still going. going. We're yeah. still going. Uh, oh, cool. We're talking about 80s, just 1980s sci-fi movies that we like. Awesome. So, what's the, what's the top of the list? 
Well, I've I've been picking the ones that I have the fond memories of, and they're they're everything crazy, like from Altered States to the Last Starfighter, which seems to be a favorite. Because back, back to the Future counts, right? Back to the Future counts, but we have we've we've we discussed kinda, that into yeah, the we ground. Kinda, we kind of started the along with Aliens and we, Star Wars and Star Trek. Yeah, because we, we we everybody knows that we love those without a doubt. We wanted to yeah. make sure to to highlight the ones that. Um, I said no talking yeah. Trek because we're you know that's been thoroughly covered you know all that good stuff and we'll we'll probably be talking Starman about Starman was an incredible movie. Yes, Starman? and it's it's oh, going to get remade great. apparently. I don't know who's going to really? remake it. Yeah. I, they're trying to make, remake that and The Last Starfighter, but nobody can get the rights to The Last Starfighter. But Starman mm-hmm. might actually stand a chance. They could redo that, I think, and get away with it. Jeff Bridges was so good in that movie. Mm-hmm. Young and talented. and just quite a, it's, it's worth it just to watch his performance. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's a sad movie, but it's still a good movie. It's still a worthwhile movie just for his yeah. performance. I can't remember the woman's name who played the other lead. Mm-hmm. I have to look, no, look it up on IMDb at some point. But, uh, yeah, we're just uh, talking about sci-fi, and we'll be revisiting Star Trek because our wedding anniversary is on the 30th of this month, and we were married at the Star Trek experience, so we'll revisit that soon, I'm sure. Oh, that's cool. That's such a bummer that it's it's gone. You, I know. You still sit at the same places, but it, mm-hmm. it's reworked. What did they do with all the... Casino. Yeah, what all did they do with the props and everything? Did they auction them off or destroy them? I don't or? know. I, I'm sure they they probably sold them or they stuck them away. I don't know what they did with them. Yeah, because we, some, we. I mean, some of the chairs are still the same. Some of the like Quark's bar is still. Some of it's still there, but it's just the signs have been taken down, and but like some of the chairs are still there. So. The bar might be the same, yeah. but it's just not Quark's anymore. Yeah, we ate at Quark's bar, and I'm pretty sure that's the only reason he married me, because I agreed <laughs> to get married at the Star Trek experience. I, as a fluke, I just asked, hey, why don't we get married at the Star Trek experience? I called his bluff. And she said, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> if he's serious about it. And next thing you know, we're there, and he's getting probed by a chair. <laughs> yeah, that was exciting. <laughs> those, those, that was your race of, of aliens that did that. Yeah. But how is it you going tonight? Me. It's good. It was a great night. It was fun. This Hollywood Forever Cemetery mm-hmm. is this beautiful cemetery. It's right behind Paramount Pictures. And they just have these events, and they've had right. them forever. But it never used to be as popular. They they used to screen, you know, classic 80s, 90s, 70s films. Um, but now, ever since last year, the year before, an episode of American Horror Story <laughs> in the episode Lady Gaga and some other people go down and watch a film at mm. Hollywood Forever Cemetery and it used to be you'd go in there and there'd be like 400 people and you'd put lots of room and hey free popcorn to anybody that shows up and now it's packed it's like 4,000 people Wow! and it was still fun I liked it when it was more of a secret instead of a right. event um, but yeah it was a good time it was just neat to see Freddy Krueger up on the screen and um, and it's just it's sort of just this eclectic it's weird because you're sitting uh, with a bunch of dead people watching a movie um, you know hanging out with the stiffs at the Hollywood Cemetery but it's <laughs> it's magic it's really really neat the only time I've seen Hollywood Cemetery was uh, when Breaking Bad did their season did their finale there and they had like the after show they had the um, the actors there and was it Chris Hardwick or somebody was there and Vince Gilligan? They were mm-hmm. up on a stage at the cemetery. When they had their and finale. what did they did? Did they screen something there? I think I, they were were watching it there or something. But they definitely had after the the it aired and it was done and it was over. They mm-hmm. had the actors up there in front of the cemetery or wherever it was. They they staged this at and you could you could obviously see that they were there. It was kind of interesting. They they had it. You know, at a cemetery, I guess, because almost everybody died <laughs> in that well, finale. Well, you know, what really got me worried, yeah. uh, Manu, is that uh, you may, when you mentioned cemetery, I know you weren't feeling w- well earlier in this week. How, <laughs> we how, <weren't. laughs> how are you doing now? I mean, we, we, you know, we get you live. Uh, in fact, we're due for another live update in about five seconds here. But you know, <laughs> but it's always great to, to you know you're you're out there you're you know engaging. But you know, I was worried that you know, man, you've been just working it so hard. Are you feeling okay, my friend? And 
Yeah, I did. I worked. I worked myself to a, a nice case of influenza there, mm. but it, it was it's sort of a perfect perfect timing for me to get sick because we got an investor who came in on who came in for enough money that we it's going to be a lot easier to retool this campaign and sh- and um, come back in March of 2017 for the circuit. Mm-hmm. It's he didn't come in for enough money to shoot the episode, but the way that things were going, it was just the right amount that we were like, well, we can't put all of that money into the Kickstarter because we would have had to do it on a bunch of separate credit cards. And that is, we'd break a few laws doing that as well, mm-hmm. which you're not supposed to, uh, you know, submit to your own campaign. Mm-hmm. So we just went, well, this messes with the numbers, but at the same time, it's a sort of a savior and, and gives us forward momentum. And so we decided to pull the campaign, put that money into episode one, and spend the next four months trying to get the word out about uh, to more people and mm-hmm. to re- the rest of the world that this is happening and we're going to run another campaign in March. And hopefully, since we'll be able to hit a much lower goal, um, we should be able to be successful and get an episode of this thing out into the universe so people can see uh, how cool the idea actually w- is going to be. Well, we definitely seen clips, and uh, that, and I think so long I got a Walter chance to Walter Koenig's read. perfume ad was hysterical. Oh, yes. <laughs> I enjoyed yeah. that. And then you going bonkers looking for Pokemon, and that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Too. yeah. Well, you know, we we shot all those things because we wanted people that were watching the campaign to have a good time while they mm-hmm. were checking in on it. Uh-huh. But what we didn't realize is we should have spent, I think, a little bit more time explaining what the film was. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until we released um, Manu and Walter Explain the Circuit, which I think is our best video, and the video we're probably going to go with next time around for our main official trailer. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think people got a little confused. I think they were watching all these funny clips and they assumed that we were making like a slapstick comedy when really the circuit is, you know, it's 10 different genres all with the same cast, all in the same location, somewhere over the weekend of a giant fictional pop culture mega event in a fictional city. Mm -hmm. And this is the place that all these different tales are going to take place. And I think when people saw all these little funny sketches, which we wanted to do because we had these actors and we had a little time and a little money and we wanted people to have fun, I think people got confused and thought, oh, this is like going to be just this slapstick sort of comedy thing. And th- it was more like we were more trying to show people what we could do for no money. <laughs> like, <laughs> here's what we're able to do for free. So give us some money for this concept and we'll really have something. Um, but, you know, looking back on it, I, I wish we would have made like a horror short you know um a comedy short uh, a little sci-fi short yeah, a little of, taste of each one um yeah and and maybe not done comedy every time you know we, we just wanted to have fun and um hindsight is 2020 but uh, i'm not ashamed of it i think they were great but i think they just may have confused people about what the circuit actually is hmm. i had a bunch of people tell me that when i was doing press and and uh you know hey you know like is this a comedy? And I'm like, well, there'll be a comedic element to the circuit. There'll be moments of comedy, but no, this is a, a multi-genre story, mm-hmm. like 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 uh, Twilight Zone the movie or Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. But what's neat about it is half of it will be written by the fans and half of it will be written by us. And the cast and crew will be made up of fans from around the world as well as the professionals, the, the small, talented crew that we have on since, since the very beginning and one of the challenges of getting the word out was kickstarter wouldn't allow us on the kickstarter page to tell people once they pledged any amount to go over to the website and contact me directly monumente reme at the circuit film and tell me why and how you want to be a part of the movie because if we announced hey we're going to put 100 people on the crew um or 15 people for each episode or whatever Kickstarter would call that a, um, what did they call it, a contest. And they don't allow contests Mm -hmm. or raffles. And so we had a real struggle getting the word out that this was a multi, that this was not a, a, this was a a fan collaborative project without being able to write anything about that on the Kickstarter page. So that's sort of the thing that we're looking at this next time around is how do we get the word out that this is fans and professionals teaming up to make a, 
a movie that's never been done. A, a multi a multi genre anthology film has never been done. I keep screaming it out to the right. to the public and it's saying, very "Hey, original. has anyone seen a multi genre anthology film?" I haven't. So somebody out there proved to me that this hasn't been you know done yet, and I don't think it has. So um, I think we've gotten that word out, but it was tough to get the word out that for five bucks you could find yourself on set. You know. Yes, I, I was. We try to talk about it anytime we can, mm -hmm. and we had our one year anniversary show back on the 29th of September, and we had listeners calling in. We said, you know, what was your favorite thing about our show? Blah blah blah, and several called in saying it was both of your appearances, and one of them said he loved the videos he was watching and the things he's watching about the circuit. He was really enjoying uh, Walter's performances too. So you are getting really cool. you are getting compliments out there, and our our listeners are are watching. And and I try we we try to retweet, we try to you know <clears throat> yeah, share on Facebook. We have a, a banner that is on our website mm -hmm. that rotates in that uh, different projects we kind of support. You that know, points to your project, and I mean we're we're definitely cheerleaders on your behalf. Well, thank you guys. It's you know the, the I think the most important trailer that we want to share now is just the Walter and Manu explain the circuit mm -hmm. because. Or it's the official trailer, I think is what it's called, if you go to the website. Yeah. And it pretty much lays the, the whole concept out there and does it in a real sweet way that has some heart. And it isn't a, you know, you don't have to sit there for eight minutes to get it. It's a three minute video. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're really pushing that one. And then thank you for your support. I think we were also, what was sort of frustrating about trying to make the call is, you know, if we would have taken the investors' money and, and figured out a way to put it into the Kickstarter, we may have gotten to a, a tipping point where, hey, we might be able to, to get this whole 200K. But we weren't willing to break laws to do it. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it was just, the, it was the best choice to just sort of like say, hey, we've, you know, we've got a private investor, that's good news, but we've got to retool this thing and, and come back at it. So we've got four more months to spread the word and, and, and get people excited about this. But what was frustrating is we were right there because I was doing all those live feeds. Yes. And and <laughs> I was starting to get more active into the social media aspect because I had time and energy because I wasn't so involved in writing the sketches and the production mm -hmm. stuff with the actors. And th we were getting to the point where like there was a lot of fans commenting, a lot of fans uh, writing in and, and sending in their videos about why the circuit was important to them and it was really beautiful to see all these people invested in the project, getting the concept, and then sending in videos telling telling me and telling the cast and the crew and the production people why they liked this concept and why it was important to them. And talking about like some some really some videos that actually brought tears to my eyes. People were were like, "Hey, my life isn't going so well right now. I'm living in Germany or." or Holland or, or America or wherever they were writing from or Canada and th and then saying, you know, why they believed in it because they wanted to get a break from their lives and I'm, I'm not being specific to anybody because I don't want, but just some people that, mm -hmm. you know, really were like inspired and we were, it was, we were reaching that tipping point where we were starting to get inspiration around the world and to pull up shop right there was tricky and I'm, I'm glad so far it's been, you know, about 95% people that are like positive and saying, Hey, we'll be with you four months from now. Exciting. And then a few people that we just totally let down because they saw it as, Oh, you're canceling this. And I'm like, no, we're not canceling this. We're, you know, keep believing it's just four more months. Um, but it was, it was really cool. So, you know, hopefully we can keep that tipping point and push it even further to, uh, worldwide knowledge mm -hmm. so next time when we launch the campaign at a lower goal we should be able to smash right through it and make a movie well it's just it's such a great concept where you know you you're part of one of the largest fan bases in the world being you know associated with star trek and then you get fans of that and you know i know there's other people who are in other uh sci-fi uh projects out there they're yeah, in the, the circuit fantasy stuff and, yeah, yeah but so i mean i'm sure this means a lot because you said you know the fans can be a part of it literally whether it's submitting the script or a donation or 
being there on set as an extra or something, that is probably yeah. the greatest appeal is you finally get to be a part of something that you're just really a bit enthusiastic about. And you, I don't have to tell you how Trek, you know, touches lives and, you know, all that. So I can just imagine what it does mean to people. Yeah, I mean, we, we wanted to, and, and as far as way more than just the writers, you know, we, when I went around on the convention circuit, I still do, but for the last 15 years, there was always somebody uh, showing me props that they'd built or cosplayers showing me an awesome wardrobe that they'd built, um, people that were into, showed me their short films or some uh, digital uh, um, visual effects that they'd been working on on, the, on their software at home or makeup artists that were at the convention showing off their makeup artists in their local film communities and indie film communities and um, people that had built entire ships. In Italy, I was I went downstairs at this convention and they had built an entire Borg uh, game where you would have to actually walk through this Borg cube and they spent like the last eight years building room to room to room in this huge facility downstairs in the basement of this um uh, convention center in Italy. And so there's people that, you know, are very capable of set design as well and every aspect of the film industry. And I went, well, why, why not do a project where the fans can come on board in every d department of filmmaking, mm. get a credit, get an experience on a, on a real set, uh, you know, on a bigger budget set uh, with actors they love and let's make a bunch of stories together and I figured the only people that are going to pull that off are the sci-fi convention family. Um, so we're basically just, the, like I said, we're going to put our, our faith in the fan base that they want to do this and spend our time trying to get the word out that it's happening. And I think if we do, I think we should be successful and we should do, we should make something that's a uh, pretty special. So, well, it's it's awesome that the fans, what fans can do for a project. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it many times, especially, you know, you see it in the uh, Star Trek community. Um, they kind of go on to other things. Star Wars is another fine example where when fans get involved. And um, But as far as dealing with the community that we love, Star Wars, I mean Star Trek, oh. <laughs> which I'll get in trouble later for this. Trust no. me, Mounter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the, what the point I'm trying to make is he that likes them both. Uh, I do like them both. It, 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 I think there's room for both. But anyway, the, the, yeah. you it's have these. Universe. <laughs> there is fan projects that are so phenomenal, and when they're backed by the fans, because the fans know what they want. And when you have that yeah. fan base involved, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like the sky's the limit. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you've got the, you know, the, the company that, uh, w that can produce it and has the money and can back it and all that. And they'll do it a certain way because they're looking to profit off of their venture. But with a fan base, it's mm -hmm. much different. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And, I, I mean, we have... A a sort of like safety valve too, that we want to bring people on that there's a lot of fans out there that are consummate professionals at what, at what they do already. I mean, the, the guy, uh, we have a person named Tobias Richter from Germany, who's a big Star Trek fan who does incredible visual effects for a company he runs called Lightworks. Mm -hmm. And they're doing all the visual effects for us on fifth passenger. And so there's people at that level that like are already pros, but we also want to bring people onto the project that are getting their feet wet and starting to learn their craft. And so th what we basically decided to, to do to allow all that is I've been in the business 20 years and I've met a, a really good team of filmmakers and I know how to keep a real small set. So what we'll do is we'll look at people's, uh, you know, we'll take a little bit of the people that are pros already and, and love what they're doing and want to help with the project. And then we'll take people that are one step down from that, that want to come learn and uh, allow their skills to build. And I basically put a really small team together of people that I trust. And then everybody else will, you know, will either hire a wardrobe to a uh, person from LA that, that really knows what they're doing and then let a couple of fans come in and work underneath her or him. And, or we'll see that 
when people submit their stuff, oh, these guys can handle it on their own. Look at all this stuff that they're doing. Uh, and then they'll either run the department or not. So I'm sure we'll have some fans running their department and other fans working for the department. And it should just be a whole bunch of fun. I think that the perfect mix of both is what I'm looking for. Uh, yeah. that, that apprentice type uh, angle is is always appealing to it's me. It's like an internship yeah, in college. It's, it's, it's definitely <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, like uh, our makeup guy is uh, definitely going to be around. Um, Thomas Supernall, who's worked on you know all the way back to Deep Space Nine and Blade Runner and Alien and all sorts of stuff. We and, talked about Blade Runner so, tonight. <laughs> yeah, he's the definitely a decent person to be an apprentice to other makeup kid that probably can school him on the, that's the fun thing is like they might be hip to some techniques that he got out of school a long time ago and he doesn't know and so he'll be able to school them and he'll look, he'll learn a little something from them at the same time and it, it should just be a, quite a ride and something that like when we all go to the theater to see it that's the the you know the 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 time that I'm looking for looking forward to is when we get to sit in a 700 person theater and actually have half of the audience be people that were at least either involved in the creation or donated money to the creation because um, I I got to see that when I went and saw Adam Nimoy's um, film for the love of Spock mm-hmm. and it was really neat because the crowd was 700 people strong or more. It was at the Egyptian theater. Um, and they put just like we do at the $25 level. Um, we might even drop that down, but he put six and a half minutes of everybody that donated on Kickstarter into the credits. And it was really special to see all those people in the theater after watching a really incredible, uh, film that tugged at your heartstrings to see all those names come across the screen and to realize that you know two or three hundred people that were on those that screen were in that room it was a really special feeling and i wanted to be involved in something like that so So you're not offering just a like a movie for people see for a lot of people it'll be an experience something they never forget because they were that directly involved and I, I don't know of any other project, of course, I don't get around much, that is like the one you're involved in now. No, no one has offered that. I mean, we, there's all Kickstarters have offered like a few, uh, buy your way on as an extra, mm-hmm. buy your way on, as, but not not a whole collaborative, like come, come make a movie with us in all facets. Uh, no one's done that either. So we've got a couple first-time things, uh, you know, uh, sort of groundbreaking ideas, and it's just whether or not people can believe that we can we can make it happen or not. Um, the studio would be terrified of it, but mm-hmm. they don't know what they're talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will agree to that, Manu. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't. I mean, I just can't stand it, man. I, I, I it's like every eighty million dollar, ninety million dollar, hundred and sixty million dollar film every weekend is like storyless remakes or horrible remakes or uh, big budget superhero movies with no plot or no story the imaginings uh, yeah I, and all that money is getting spent and i'm like wow just give me just a little less than 1 million and i can give you eight beautiful stories that have heart that have production value that don't waste money that don't rely on just spectacle um I'm just, I'm sort of, I think some, I'm hoping some, I think it's sort of like the future of uh, filmmaking in general is going to become more of an indie, more of a crowdfunding, more of a Mm -hmm. watch on your computer streaming uh, service. And it's already becoming that with Netflix and Amazon and and all these shows springing up uh, and production springing up around the world. Well, I think um, it, it in part uh, is, uh, you know, I, I speak from experience in watching so much uh, that I have is that, you know, you get vested in things and then in the end, 
the company only breaks your heart because you, you're wanting it to be more there and you want it this way and they don't deliver on that and the indie, yeah. the indie film is so, so satisfying uh, not necessarily just for uh, the watcher but I imagine for the producer because they get to produce their own uh, production the way they see the see fit to that and, and yeah, yeah Netflix is one of those I brag about Netflix all the time on the show that it's a great way to watch these uh, definitely these independent films out there yeah and and the shows too I mean I, I watched a show on Netflix recently that the the circuit is good kind of stealing the essence from and and or borrowing stealing is a bad word uh but strange i think it's called stranger stranger than stranger things yeah yes Did you oh, see stranger things oh my gosh we've um, gushed over that tonight oh, it's great. yeah and and so there's you know we have a similar thing going on with the reason that this particular convention has these different uh, has the ability to be a place where these different dimensionalities and different genre stories are breaking through and all happening in the same location. There's a reason behind it. And it's sort of like the stranger things, uh, X files type secret mm -hmm. government stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, and so that's going to be really fun too, is there's stories within the stories and we can go a few levels deep. Um, because we, we, as soon as we got the investor, we spent, the last week and a half just well when i wasn't sick tearing through all the fan screenplays and getting the structure together for the for the whole film uh or the whole series whatever it ends up being um you know if we if we make so many episodes that uh it it's more than a two and a half an hour half hour two and a half hour movie it'll probably be a series or if we make episode one and we make it so as well as we want to, um, at that point, the studios might come out of the woodworks and say, hey, we want to make the best of these for you. And my only demand would be, okay, as long as we can keep the fan base coming in and working on this thing with us. And for me, that's like another show right on top of it because then you could film behind the scenes. Like a documentary. Make another, yeah, make another half an hour series out of, the experience of all the people that get to come and work on it. I think that's, so, that's just a lovely idea. I mean, I would almost, if I had the money, I would almost donate that just to get a chance to uh, hug the stuffings out of Robert Picardo. <laughs> that's all I want to yeah. do. I just do it once and I'll get on with my life, you know? <laughs> I love that man. He's he's incredible. Yeah. The, as of now, he's in the first episode. We, we, uh, we've been pouring over which episode we're going to shoot. And at this particular moment, he's, he's in the first one. I read the eight page, uh, script you have on the Kickstarter. Yeah. That one is like become a hybrid because we have this, like I was telling you, we have this idea for why the circuit is, why this particular Megacon uh, has got this magic in it. And we we're sort of, um, the first episode has to establish, you know, who, why, when, and where, mm -hmm. what is this show? Um, what is this film? And the, that, that story hybrid with the, with the new idea that we have to explain, you know, why things are magic at this particular event. Um, uh, we're sort of crossbreeding those first eight pages that you read with, the idea that blossomed in the last week and a half and it'll be a similar, I mean, it's basically the, the same script with a little bit more of a deep thing happening between Robert and Ethan. I, when I read that, but, I was like, I wonder if I could, I could see them having a conversation like this in real life, you know, like that's like more their personalities of, of who they are kind of leaking out. But there was also from, from the, uh, Picardo's part of the script, a lot of the doctor in there with that sort of disdain he had for Neelix's enthusiasm and or you know it's it's funny to see how some of the that kind of comes through with that dialogue oh the writer was great i i james wrote it i i came up with the concept and then i tapped my friend james bird to write it and i immediately had james and uh ethan have a long conversation on the phone so that he could get their voice um, he didn't talk with Robert because he'd seen enough of Robert's work that he was like, okay, I think I can write Robert's voice. 
Um, and I told him the kind of person Robert was, and that was enough. But he really captured both their voices really well in that screenplay. Just who they are as people. It's, it's pretty, I was blown away at how well he did that, not knowing them personally. Mm, that I picked up, yeah, I could definitely pick up on uh, Picardo's kind of that doctor's yeah. attitude in the, that script. Have you ever gotten the uh, pleasure to meet Johnny or Ethan? Nope. Nope. The closest we yeah. got was Comic Palooza here in Houston. We were in the same room as Robert McNeil, they, and that's it. The, the <laughs> unfortunate uh, downside was that they canceled the press junket. Uh, Before, for, yeah, and, we had uh, press pass. And uh, so we mm-hmm. didn't get a chance to actually meet a lot of people. We but, don't, But we don't know who was there because they we, didn't tell. We were in the same room with Robbie, and uh, it was entertaining to hear him talk and uh, – uh, you know, I guess something's better than nothing. Trek fans are kind of amazing. Not only do they know everything you did in whatever part of Trek you're involved, they know, like, if you're directing or producing or acting or doing writing, something else, they know all that. They know everything you've ever been in, what you're doing now. You know, it just they follow your entire career. It's not just yeah. Trek. It's the reason we put this whole thing together, not just the Trek fans, but for me personally, uh, mostly the Trek fans, but it, when we started talking about this, you know, uh, me and Walter started talking about this a couple of years ago in a, in a diner. And we wanted to do something that we all felt that our careers have been sustained for so long by the sci-fi fans that have watched uh, our work. And we, we wanted to do something that involved the fans and at the same time celebrated the genres we loved and at the same time celebrated 50 years of what we've been doing at these conventions and, and coming together. And this is sort of the con- the concept that came out of all that, you know, uh, need to sort of pay back and give something back at the same time as um, make something neat. Well, it's definitely neat. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll keep uh, retweeting and getting the word out there as much as we can. Uh, it's a shame. I can't think of a way to really promote it when we go to the Houston mini maker fair in November, maybe uh, we can I get can some send word you out. a bunch of flyers if you want to pass oh. out some flyers while mm-hmm. you're there. Yeah, that'd we, be great. Anything we can do to help, we we you know we'd love to do that because we're going to be there um, Saturday and Sunday, broadcasting live and interviewing people. And you know, Maker Fair is for anybody that creates. You could be a filmmaker, a robot maker, cosplay, makeup artist. It's for anybody mm-hmm. that wants to, you know, make something and show it to other people. When is it? It is November 12th and 13th. It's a Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, so just uh, email me your address. I should be able to get you some stuff out That'd there. That'd be great. Cool. A few, a few hundred flyers help. just to pass out. I'll Thank get the you. word out. Yeah. And then I'm always trying to, that's what you know, I'm going to spend the next four months doing, too, is just talking to a, a lot of the different conventions of different kinds that I've been to and seeing if um, some of those conventions are willing to officially uh, support us and maybe send send the the concept out to their email list of of people that have attended their convention and just let them know that it's happening with a nice little link to what we're doing. Um, Because that, that I think, clearly is what we need, is just a a bigger profile. And if more people knew about it, I think we would be able to fund fund this pretty quickly. Mm. Um, One of the weird things that happened when we ran the campaign is our PR rep, we got these horrible PR agents that I, uh, public relations people that I sent, that I actually gave a bunch of money to. They went out and they released a press release for us. I had secured like 12 interviews with different press, uh, uh, online magazines and different people, um, and folks like you and podcasts and et cetera. And these guys came back and they were like, oh, um, you know, we didn't get as good a response back as we thought we were going to. This is going to be a lot of work. Uh, so we're we're just, we don't think we're the right people for you. So we're going to uh, give you half your money back. Hmm. So, so these guys didn't do, like, they didn't get me one article with all the actors and professionals and with the whole concept. They couldn't get me one article. And then they took six grand. <laughs> wow. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah. I know. Just thieves, and and so that was like one of the most depressing things that started when you know. So at the beginning of the campaign, we didn't have a PR rep, and it became me. And so I spent as much time as I could trying to get us 
press, and we we did okay. We got some articles, but I, we figured, gosh, we have twenty actors in this thing. We should be doing you know three or four articles a day, having someone else from the cast or crew pick them up. And um, so the next time around, we'll have somebody better on the pre- in the press world too. Wow, I just just. And it's easy to run into thieves in the PR world, but we thought we got a good recommendation. It just, we didn't. It was unfortunate. They said hard.